welcome to another one of my videos. You can help support this channel by subscribing and liking and by grabbing one of my free ebooks. I'll put a link in the upper right hand corner and also in the description to the free ebooks. Now to today's video. In today's video, we'll be listening to one of my mysteries. The title is The Missing Japanese Chin, and it is part of the Ronin Half Sword Will Travel mystery series. This is the Ronin's origin story. You can find the ebook only on Amazon, and you can read it for free if you have Kindle Unlimited. The ebook is actually an illustrated story with lots of amazing pictures so if you would like to grab it and look on as you listen I'll leave a link in the upper right hand corner and in the description to where you can either purchase it or read it for free with Kindle Unlimited. And now sit back, relax, and enjoy the read. The Missing Japanese Chin Mystery, Number Zero Prequel Horo Shaw's Origin, Ronan Have Sword Will Travel Mystery Series, by Christy Lynn Higgins. Prologue Magi was a world fusing East and West cultures during an era before the emergence of the steam engine. In this world, the sword was the ultimate weapon and brought order to the planet under the Emperor. The Shogun was the highest ranking military officer who was just under the Emperor in power. The Shogun along with the Shogunate, military officers with the title Overlords, reigned supreme over the citizens of the One World Empire. Each Overlord ruled a clan, and each clan was made up of Samurai houses. Each Samurai or Lord and their house owed their allegiance to only one Overlord who was their master. The Samurai were the military nobility and officer caste, and they ruled over a province for their Overlord in this social class system. The Empire was broken down into regions, which under the authority of the Emperor and Shogun, were ruled by the overlords. Regions were made up of provinces under the rule of a samurai lord. Provinces were further broken down into towns governed by governors. The samurai families of the House of Shakajuru, which bore the symbol of the red crown crane, and the House of Nishikigoi, which bore the symbol of the koi, were longtime allies. Their provinces bordered one another, and their house would come to the aid of the other against bandits or rival overlords and their samurai. Magi was enjoying a time of peace and prosperity. Rivalries between overlords were fought with words and speeches on the floor of the shogunate house and not on the battlefield. Bandits were still a problem but usually only in the remote areas. Peace seemed a thing of everlasting existence, and war was perceived as a mythical beast that only lived in the legends of the past. T haiku. T simple small truths. Everything has a dawning. From Sweet to Bitter, Chapter 1, Very Short Intro for One Troublesome Child. Yoke, come back here, a woman yelled, followed by the gleeful laughter of a little girl as she escaped her nanny. Teacher, her tiny feet thundered across the wooden floor, fleeing the one who wanted to dress her. Yoke's laughter gave joy to all who heard it and filled their hearts with delight as if the sun had already risen. Her laughter was especially relished by her older brother and her older sister. The little girl chased after the family dog and ran away from her nanny, Yoke. Keikenda yelled again after the precocious little girl. Don't make me chase you. Come back, you troublesome child. Chapter 2. What her sister thought. Dawn broke over the lush green land, bringing a host of yellow and orange hues. A tall white crane trimmed in black with a tuft of red upon its head walked the water garden of the Japanese-style castle estate. The graceful red crown crane eyed an equally graceful red and white koi within the pond it strolled beside. The bird started to stalk the fish when a shoji slid open and a beautiful older girl, dressed in a white kimono decorated by pale blue lunar glow moths, walked out. She, who had just turned 14 a few days ago, entered the outer corridor that wrapped around part of the main castle estate and startled the crane. The bird flew away in a panic. The older girl peered at the rising sun as it peeked over the protective walls of her family's castle estate. They were safe behind the fortress-like structure's high walls. A single gate entered the structure, and it was heavily guarded during the day and locked up tight during the night, and guarded by the watchmen around the clock. Her father was a samurai whose master was overlord Tanaka and since her father was a samurai lord, she was among the nobility. She turned her attention to the red and white koi within the pond, which was the second largest of all the koi, 
as it swam among the others. She peered at this attractive fish as if she was a moth drawn to a passionate flame kindling deep within her soul. She, one named after the cherry blossom, envisioned her future with a husband she had yet to wed. Sekura saw children of her own, and she also saw herself sitting beside her husband. Her sister's gleeful laughter drew her thoughts away from the dream that was filled with her heart's desires and forced her mind to return to the reality of her responsibilities. Yoke, come here and let me brush your hair. Sekira spoke as she waved her half-dressed sister over to her. Her younger sister moved and sat on the wooden floor before her, dangled her feet over the edge, and stared into their water garden. Sekira knelt behind her and removed a comb from her sash. The comb, that once belonged to her mother, was made from a mother-of-pearl shell that was decorated with a yellow daffodil. Sekira combed her sister's hair, a ritual she looked forward to every morning. Tell me about our mother? Yoke spoke as she tried to sit still. Our mother was very beautiful. I heard that you look like her, Yoke said as she fluttered her feet as if they were the wings of a butterfly. I do not think I can ever compare to her. Sekira spoke as she gently brought the teeth of the comb through Yoke's hair. They and their brother had their mother's violet black hair. Sekira followed the comb with her hand and smoothed it down her sister's soft strands. Yoke, do you know that I love you? As much as I love you, her younger sister replied. Yoke, do you know that I love you more than I love myself? She turned and peered at Sekira as if she didn't understand. Sekira put a hand to the side of her face as she stared deep into her eyes, eyes that revealed so much about the gifted child. I love you and our brother so much. There is nothing I would not do for you too. I love you too, Yoke told her, not really understanding the depths of her sister's affections for her. Sekira finished brushing her hair just as Keikenda. The nanny arrived. She was holding their black and white dog, Fluffy. The older woman looked exhausted as if she had been running. You are such a troublesome child. Clever? Very clever but still troublesome, the nanny told her. Ki, Yoke called out to the woman, happy to see the nanny had finished her game. Do not call me that, Keikenda told her. I do not like to be called hair. Sekira questioned as the nanny still panted from her run. What did my sister do this time? Why is one, who has equally tormented me with her pranks and clever ruses, inquiring of her sister? Keikenda questioned the 14-year-old. Sekira answered, I only wanted to know which of us sisters is the cleverest. The nanny sighed as she thought about it, and then she answered, I believe you're neck and neck right now. I will have to improve my games, Sekira spoke, implying future mischief. I will not be outdone by one such as she. It will be a battle of sides. I, with my mother's hazel eyes and yoke. She tenderly grabbed hold of her sister's face and peered into her light green eyes that were green like a jade as she added, dot 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 with her father's eyes. We will see in the end who is the cleverest. Sekira kissed her on the forehead and then released her sister as she spoke. Now, tell me what my sister did this time. The nanny glared at the fidgeting Japanese chin in her arms as she answered. She gave Fluffy her sash, and the equally conniving dog ran off with it. I had a time chasing it down. The nanny, who was a disgraced priestess her family took in, finished dressing her younger sister, and then she took Yoke and the Japanese chin to have their breakfast. Sakura started to follow them in but paused as she once again turned her attention to the pond. The largest of the koi, a gold-black speckled brute, was belly up. The red and white koi was feeding on it. She was bothered by this imagery and grimaced at what this ghastly omen might mean. Sakura fixated her eyes on the now-dominant koi and then entered her home. Chapter 3. Father's Friend Sakura ate breakfast with her sister and her brother, and then she walked to her father's office. She heard his friend, Ryo, talking with her father. Haruto, so she waited outside and listened in through the room divider. The room divider is all the shoji in the estate consisted of translucent paper over a frame of wood held together by a lattice of bamboo. Inside the office, Haruto sat on a floor pillow on a slightly raised area in the middle of the room. His friend sat across from him and their swords rested on the wooden floor by their sides. I am sorry to hear that Lord Nishikigoi passed away. Haruto told his friend. He was one of the great warriors of your clan. He was a brute, Ryo spoke. He was harsh to the people and he was harsh with me and my mother while she was still alive. I will change the way I rule. Haruto wasn't sure what he should say on that subject, so he changed it by saying, Speaking of which, I should call you Lord Nishikigoi. Now, does that mean I have to refer to you as Lord Shakadzuru? Not while it is just the two of us, old friend. Haruto smiled and then said, Do you remember when we were still children and the two of us along with Suisen would play in the orchard? I do, Haruto said. The three of us were inseparable. We were, and the three of us loved each other as brothers and sister. Time did change that. I have to admit that I have always been jealous of you. Suisen chose you to be her husband, Ryo spoke, making light of it. And then he noticed it still pained his friend to speak of her. Ryo asked, How long has it been now? 
Haruto considered his question and answered, Yoka's five now so five years. Suisen has been gone five long years. Outside, a servant came with tea, and Sekura told her, I will take it in. She took the wooden tray with the cast iron tea set from the servant. Sekura waited until she left before she knelt and spoke through the room divider. Father, may I come in? I have your tea. Yes, Sekura. Come in. Ryo perked up as she slid open the shoji and brought the tray in. Haruto and Ryo sat on the floor, facing each other, and Sekura came aside her father out of the way and began pouring their drinks. Haruto noticed the look Ryo gave his daughter and said, I have finalized the marriage agreement between my house and the house of Watanabe. Sekura is to marry their eldest son in two years when she comes of age. It sounds like a good match. You should select yourself a wife, Haruto told his friend. Your parents are not around to make a contract for you so you are free to select your own wife. I hear that Chihiro has come of age. I am not sure we are a good match, Ryo stated. There is strife between our houses and speaking of strife. I hear Lord Gima has been whispering in our overlord's ear. What sort of things has he been whispering to overlord Tanaka? Haruto asked. Lord Gima does not believe you should be in charge of the silk production in the Kai province. Haruto said, the Kai province once belonged to the house of Gima. Our overlord is the one who decided to give the province to my father and since that time, silk production has increased by 18%. Lord Gima boasts that in five years he can increase production by 35% if he is given the province, Ryo stated. Why tell me these things? Our overlord is the final say on who manages what for him. Ryo replied, I am telling you this because if Lord Gima can't convince overlord Tanaka to return the province back to his family, he might find another means to resecure it. Sakura finished pouring the two men's tea, and she said, I heard that your father died. He passed peacefully away in his sleep last night, Ryo stated. His end was nothing like his reign. Sakura took his comment to mean that Ryo wished for a more deserving end for his father. Ryo glanced at her as she handed him a cast iron teacup with a crane decorating it. He took the teacup from her and told her father, I believe one can only attain what they truly want if they are willing to shape sacrifices. Do you not mean make sacrifices? Haruto questioned him. I mean, father? Haruto's only son and middle child beckon. Come in, Rico. The boy came in and went and took his position by sitting beside his father. His older sister raised her eyes without raising her head to peer at them as the younger was seemingly looking down on the older. She glanced at her father who had kind light brown eyes, and then she peered at her brother who had inherited the same kind light brown eyes. Would you like some tea? Sakura questioned her brother from her position set aside from the others, and she noticed the vacant spot next to her father on his left side. I am fine, Rico answered. Ryo peered at the boy and said, You have grown two inches since last I saw you. Sakura believes because I am growing so fast that I will be taller than father. I don't know if anyone can be taller than your father, Ryo commented. Here, Rico. I brought you something. Ryo removed a tanto or dagger from a pocket in the sleeve of his kimono, handed it to the boy, and said, This once belonged to my father. Shouldn't you keep it? Rico questioned him. No, I think it would be appropriate that you have it. My grandfather gave it to my father to aid him in his journey to become a man. Rico grabbed hold of a tiger claw that he wore around his neck as he said, My father gave me something similar. He gave me this claw from a tiger he killed in his youth. Rico turned to his father who he greatly admired. Honor me in the same way by taking this gift, Rio told him. Rico glanced at his father, and Haruto nodded. So Rico held out his hands to his father's friend. Ryo placed the small dagger in the boy's outstretched hands. Rico examined the tanto, and two koi decorated the bamboo sheath. He removed the dagger and a koi also decorated its blade. Thank you. You can thank me by allowing that blade to serve you in your journey, sad haiku. Five yellow flowers. Placed on beloved stone grave. Five yellow flowers. Chapter 4. A mother remembered. Ryo spent the afternoon with Haruto and his family. The two friends reminisced, and then Ryo returned to his own province. Sakura and her brother left their father's side, and Sakura asked, Riko, will you go with me to visit our mother's grave? Of course, I will pick her favorite flower before we go. Some time later, Riko held a bouquet of yellow daffodils as they made their way to their mother's grave. He had just joined his sister, and Riko looked all around before he asked, Where is Yoke? She is still too young to come, besides, Yoke does not remember our mother as we do. Do you still blame her for our mother's death? Riko questioned his older sister. I do not blame her, Sekura answered. How could Yoke be to blame? She was a baby. You wanted nothing to do with her the first year of her life. I was still a child then. Are you saying you are an adult now? Rico inquired. Do you believe you are ready to take on the responsibilities of a house? Necessity has made me an adult, Sekura replied. You will one day take over as lord in our father's stead. 
I, when I become a woman, must cling to my husband to find any position in this world. Father's choice is still a good choice. I am glad father selected him to be your husband. Selected him for me without consulting me, Sekira stated. I do not see the man as the best choice. His house's standing is so beneath our house. If you want a house with better standing, I would say you could marry one of Rio's children since his house is equal with ours. But he still needs to marry and have children. So you would have a long wait. A long wait indeed, Sekira stated. Sekira lit incense for their mother, Suisen, and then Rico laid the bouquet of daffodils on her grave. They both stood there in silence for a long time, and then they returned to the estate. Chapter 5 The night it all went wrong, that evening. An owl greeted the night as Sekira sat in her room alone upon her futon. She had been lying down, but she had become restless so she got up and lit a candle. She stared at its flame as it flickered about, lighting up her dark room. All sound faded around her, not that everything had gone quiet. On the contrary, the castle estate erupted with a loud distant commotion that gradually became louder and closer. She ignored the sounds as she focused on the candle and the flame. Time progressed as she was frozen in the moment. Only she, the candle, and the flame existed. Sekira waved her hand over the candle, causing the flame to bend, and then straighten back up. She ran her hand through the small fire, and then she held her hand over the flame to see how long she could keep it there. The flame started to burn her when a voice called for her and pulled her back into the chaotic present. Sakura. Several minutes earlier, Rico hurried to his older sister's room, carrying their father's longsword in one hand, and holding tightly to his younger sister with his other hand. Their sock-covered feet thundered across the wooden floor as fire devoured their castle estate home. His sisters were in trouble. He had to protect them. Night made the terror only that more nightmarish as the screams of men and women drowned out their panicked thoughts. There were other sounds other than the desperate screams of those devoured by fire. There were sounds of battle as steel clashed with steel. Many men had entered their home and their forces had overrun his family's forces. Sakura, he called out as he entered his older sister's room. Bandits have attacked. Smoke burned his eyes and made his throat raw. The fire had yet to reach this area of the castle estate, but its smoke made it hard to see and breathe. Sakura, Rico called out again. I am here. What happened? Rico replied, I heard that someone opened the front gate and let our enemy in. They are killing everyone. Where is father? I do not know, Rico answered. I went to his room but only found his sword. There was also blood. Lots of blood. He held up the katana still sheathed in its decorative scabbard with a red crown crane decorating it. We need to get outside. Everything is on fire. Before they had a chance to flee, heavy footsteps were heard just outside and then three armed men appeared. Rico released Yoke, and she ran over to Sekira. In her panic, she ran into her older sister and dislodged their mother's comb from Sekira's sash, and the comb fell to the floor. Rico unsheathed his father's sword and faced the three bandits, but they were not bandits. The men were dressed all in black. They were shinobi, trained assassins, bloodthirsty rogues. His arms quaked as he had only practiced the blade and had yet to draw blood in a real duel. Rico glanced at his sisters, who he dearly loved, and grabbed a hold of the tiger claw necklace he wore, trying to find strength from it. He would protect them with his life. Rico placed both hands to the hilt of the sword, gave a mighty cry, and charged the three shinobi. He attacked them, but they ignored his childish assault as if they had plans for him other than slaying him like they had slain his father. The leader of the shinobi moved out of the boy's aimless charge and then hit him on the rump with the flat side of his own sword. Rico turned and screamed at them. He again charged the leader of the shinobi, but the ninja easily disarmed him, and then he kicked Rico in the stomach. The boy doubled over as the shinobi laughed. Rico drew the dagger Rio had given him and sliced at the leader of the shinobi, cutting him across the cheek. The shinobi screeched in pain and then thrust his sword through the boy. Sakura screamed as the perfect world she had envisioned for her future self turned to ash as her family home turned to ash. A ronin, a masterless samurai. Chapter 6 Enter the ronin 12 years later. Kai province under Lord Gima's rule. A ronin entered the town of Yukon, walked to the local postings, and nailed up an advertisement on the erected wood wall just outside of the town. The stranger wore a roningasa, a conical hat made from bamboo with a tuft of bamboo sticking straight up like a tassel. A barefoot street boy, who was about 10, noticed the runny ronin who was dressed in a shabby kimono and dingy hakama, traditional Japanese trousers. The ronin also wore zori, sandals made from straw. The street boy's yukata, a light cotton kimono, was even shabbier than the stranger's. The ronin had a katana with a red crown crane decorating its scabbard tucked in his sash. The boy could barely see his face because of the hat, but the ronin did have violet black hair. The kid noticed as the ronin hammered the posting up with a nail and a rock that the ronin's hands and forearms were covered in scars as if the warrior had seen a lot of action. 
The kid, who was endowed with the wisdom of the streets, went and read over the posting. He still needed work on his reading, but he managed to read the posting. Ha! Have sword, we'll travel. The kid looked over the ronin and saw an opportunity for himself. The boy said, you must be new to Yukon. I could help you out. I have a lot of connections here and... The ronin walked off, heading into the town. Hey, you, ronin, wait up. The boy yelled after the warrior. You shouldn't let this opportunity pass you by. I might look like your average snot-nosed kid, but I pay attention. You could say I know how to play the political game here. The ronin continued to ignore him as the boy walked beside him. You don't talk much, but that's fine. I'm told I talk enough for three people. So, what about my offer? He asked and waited on a reply. You must be wondering what I want out of our partnership. I want food, a roof over my head, a blanket, and coin if you swing a job and complete it. The ronin still continue to ignore him. Come on, say something. Prove I'm not talking to some samurai's ghost. The ronin paused and peered at the boy for the very first time. The boy still couldn't see his face very clearly under the hat, but the ronin's stare was intense. The ronin turned and continued on his way. I'm Rico, the boy shouted after him. And one day I will be the governor of this town. The ronin turned and peered at him curiously. What's your name? The boy questioned. I told you my name so you are supposed to tell me yours. The ronin turned from him for a third time and walked away from him. Fine. I don't need to know your name, Rico told him as he chased after the ronin. I can't call you, ronin. That might bring unwanted attention on you. I know. I will just call you, Horosha. Thunder rumbled overhead as dark clouds moved into the area. Rico said, the first thing we need to do is find us a room. I know of a place that is cheap, and it happens to be behind a small kitchen so we can also get us something to eat. Rico's stomach rumbled as he spoke as if he could taste them. They serve the best dumplings in the province, and they're cheap. The boy's stomach rumbled again, and then the ronin stopped. The ronin's stomach rumbled, and then the ronin sighed. The ronin removed a leather money pouch and dumped its contents. Three copper coins were all that was left. Rico may be the person needed to make it through until the next job was done. Show me this cheap room, the ronin spoke. Right this way, Rico stated. Delicious haiku. Savory dumplings. Fill my hungry gut with joy. Doughy tasty food. Chapter 7. Dumplings. Annie, Rico shouted. I've got a customer for you. A woman in her 40s peered out of the rustic kitchen with a few tables set up in front of it. And she snapped, I'm not your aunt. Did I mention a paying customer, nephew? Welcome home, she uttered. What can I get you two? Two orders of dumplings in the room behind your place. She looked over the ronin and said, let me see your coin first. The ronin placed a copper coin on the table. She quickly picked it up and said, three days and nights in the room and an order of dumplings apiece for each day. The ronin nodded. I'll get started on your order. Gyoza. Japanese fried dumplings she headed into the kitchen as three men strolled in. Rico took one look at them and moved away from the ronin as they walked over to the counter that separated the kitchen from the eating area. We're here for the money, one of the thugs said. The woman walked to her side of the counter and spoke. I don't have it. One of the men, who had a cut across his right eye and no longer had use of it, threatened, you need to pay or we'll burn your house down. She peered at the ronin to see if he would do anything, but the ronin only stood there. She told the thug, Kaido, I don't have it. Kaido, the ronin repeated. Your name is Kaido. He turned to the shabby looking ronin and asked, what if it is? The ronin focused on the man's one eye and questioned, are you? Kaido, the night watchman who guarded the main gate to Shakajiru Castle Estate. A flicker of terror sparked in his one eye, and then the thug answered, I don't know what you're talking about. You are him, the ronin spoke and placed a hand to the hilt of the crane sword. Kaido, do you believe this guy? One of the other thugs questioned. This ronin believes he's going to outdraw you. Doesn't he know that you're an Aijutsu master? Aijutsu master? The ronin repeated. I've never gone up against someone with a quick draw technique. Kaido, do you believe this guy? He must not have heard of you or your quick draw technique. They don't call it lightning strike for no reason. Maybe I should demonstrate it, Kaido spoke, hoping not to have to fight anyone today. The thug quickly unsheathed his katana, swiped up, knocked the ronin's hat off, and cut the ronin across the forehead. A trickle of blood ran from the slate cut, and the ronin never moved during the attack. Not that the ronin had a chance to. Did you see that? One of the thugs with Kaido laughed out. I didn't see that. It was so fast. Look how stunned the ronin is. No one's faster than Kaido when it comes to him unsheathing his sword. Move along ronin if you know what's good for you and let us conduct our business. I need to know what happened that night. The ronin spoke in a calm voice that gave away no emotion. Are you the one who opened the gate for them? Did you let the ninjas in? This ronin just don't pay attention, the one thug said. 
We need to take care of him, Kaido. I just can't cut the man down, Kaido spoke. Not unless. I invoked the right of Charanji, the Ronin declared. The right of Charanji was a one-on-one -on -one duel that settled a matter between two warriors. The Ronin said, if I win, you will answer all of my questions. As the one challenged, Kaido could decline the fight but only under penalty of losing his honor, bringing disgrace to his family. I accept, Kaido answered. Also as the challenged, he selected the time and place of the duel. We will fight right here and right now and if I win, you will give me that exquisite sword you have. The Rana nodded and drew the crane sword. Kaido walked forward as the two thugs moved out of the way. Chapter 8. Lightning Strike. The two warriors faced each other. The right of Charanji might seem like a simple challenge, but both warriors knew they could lose their life during the duel. Kaido prepared to use his lightning strike again but this time, his intention was to kill the Ronin. Kaido unsheathed his sword as before. Actually, Kaido unsheathed his sword a split second faster than before and cut across the Ronin. To him, it looked like the Ronin reacted only after it was too late but the Ronin's blade still came at him and cut him across his sword arm. Kaido stumbled back a few paces, believing they had both been severely wounded, but the Ronin stood before him with only the small cut on his forehead he had delivered when he first drew his sword. Do you yield? The Ronin questioned. Your arm is badly damaged. I doubt you could use your technique on me a third time. Kaido, take out this guy. Don't let him talk to you this way. Kaido peered down at his arm and said, the Ronin's right. I can barely hold my sword. He used some sort of technique on me that has nearly rendered my arm useless. The Ronin warned him, my next strike will maim you permanently. You will never hold a sword again. I concede defeat, Kaido spoke. The two thugs with him drew their swords. The Ronin turned to them and asked, could either one of you best Kaido? No, he's so fast. If I just defeated him, what sort of chance would the two of you have against me? The two thugs glanced at one another, and then they ran out. Tell me, the Ronin began, turning to Kaido. Did you let the ninjas in? I did not, he answered as the kitchen woman started to tend to his wound. Riko also came out of hiding. Kaido said, I was a loyal servant to the house of Shakajiru. Asahi, the night watchman who was stationed there with me, suddenly attacked me and took my eye. If only I had perfected my quick draw technique back then and then this wouldn't have happened. He spoke as he motioned to his face and the eye that was no more. Did Asahi also render you a mute? The Ronin questioned him. Why didn't you sound the alarm? Asahi threatened me. He told me he would tell everyone that I unlocked the gate. The Ronin said, Asahi couldn't have unlocked the gate. There was only one key and father had it. Father, Kaido spoke. Young master, is that you? The Ronin grabbed the tiger claw and told him. The young master died that night. The entire Shakajiru family died that night. The Ronin moved and considered striking down the former night watchman. The Ronin yelled, you are a disgrace to the house of Shakajiru. Lord Shakajiru died because you didn't sound the alarm. Kaido got down on his knees and begged, young master, tell me how I can atone. I have lived with this disgrace for far too long. In a calmer voice, the Ronin said, if you want to atone, leave this place and never come back and bother this woman. You were a proud guard of the house of Shakajiru. How did you become a thug? When did gold or power become more important than your honor? My eye, don't blame your eye as if it held your honor. I panicked, own up to it. I know what fear is. I stood helplessly by as my siblings were slaughtered. I ran away, but I will not run away again. I will find out what happened that night. I will make all those responsible pay for what they did. Tell me where I can find Asahi. I hear he is now the bodyguard of the governor's wife who resides in this town. Where does this first lady live? In the estate on the hill that overlooks this town, Kaido answered. The place is shut up tight. You won't get in. My home was also shut up tight and yet it burned to the ground. The Ronin turned and headed out of the kitchen, and the boy ran after the Ronin. Where are you going? The Ronin turned to Riko and replied, I'm going to the estate that is on the hill. Kaido was right. You won't get in. I won't know for sure until I try. Riko glanced back at the kitchen and said, We should eat first. We can't storm a castle on an empty stomach. I thought this place was only an estate and when did you become part of we? The Ronin questioned him. You hid away while I dealt with the thugs. Riko said, You have the sword, and I have the brains. I hid away so that I could keep my head. You are a smart kid, Riko. You remind me of myself when I was younger. We will only scout around the estate today. I will figure out a way into it by tomorrow. Run back and tell the woman we will return later so she will have our dumplings ready on our return. Chapter 9. Red Light District The two thugs ran back to their hideout within the red light district of the town of Yugen. A few of the women, who worked for the gang, were in the room. They both ran in yelling, Boss, boss, what is it? The head of their gang questioned as he glanced up from the hand-copied book he was reading. You know I hate to be disturbed when I'm reading my detective novels. 
It's Kaido. He was defeated in a rite of Cherenji by a Ronin. Is he dead? No, Kaido is still alive, one thug answered. The Ronin wanted to ask him some questions. Did one of the other gangs hire this Ronin? I don't think so. He just happened to be at the kitchen when we went to collect your money. Did the woman at the kitchen hire him? I don't think so. The Ronin seemed to mind his own business until Kaido's name was mentioned. Interesting. Maybe this Ronin only wanted to test his own technique against Kaido's lightning strike. How was this Ronin's skill? I've never seen a sword style like his. It was more unrefined than tempered, but he still managed to avoid the lightning strike attack and deliver a blow that incapacitated Kaido. That's not how I saw it. The other thug spoke up. The Ronin didn't avoid the attack but more like, go on, the boss urged him when he didn't finish. It was more like the Ronin was a ghost and the blade passed right through him. Are you telling me you saw Kaido's blade cut right through this Ronin as if he was more of an apparition? No. The thug replied as he shook his head. Kaido did cut the Ronin when he was showing off his technique before the challenge was made. I am saying it was more like Kaido's blade made contact but there was no damage. I'm pretty sure the blade sliced right through the Ronin's kimono. Have you two been drinking? How many times have I told you not to drink until after you have collected my money? Sorry, boss, they both said. Where is Kaido now? We. The one thug glanced at the other and said, We left him at the kitchen and ran straight here. Cowards. Bring me this Ron and his penance for leaving Kaido behind. Also, go see if Kaido is still alive. Yes, boss, they both replied. Travel haiku. Road ahead of me. Dirt under my straw sandals. Short sweet journey starts. Chapter 10. Passing a Norimono. The Ronin and Rico made their way to the governor's estate and passed a Norimono also known as a litter that was along the side of the road. The Norimono was a wheelless carriage of sorts with room for only one person to ride within its box. A single beam was inserted through the top of the Norimono and then the beam was placed on the shoulders of the men who carried it to its destination. The litter appeared disabled as the beam laid on the side of the road with a large crack through it. The housekeeper is expecting me and my apt mind for solving mysteries. An elderly samurai spoke to one of the men who had been carrying him. The elderly man held an abacus which was an oblong wooden frame with rows of wires along which beads were slit that was used for calculating. The samurai asked, how long until it is fixed? I sent my partner back for a new Norimono to come and meet us. It should be here within two hours. It might be faster if you walk. The governor's estate is only another hour from here. I will wait, the elderly samurai stated and I will let you explain to the housekeeper why I am late once we reach the Kawa estate. The Ronin and Rico continued on and an hour later when they started across the last stretch of road before the estate's main gate, Rico inquired, aren't we getting a little close for a scouting mission? I actually have an idea as to how to get us in, the Ronin said. They approached the gate, and the day watchman lifted his hand and commanded, halt, state your business here. I am here to see the housekeeper, tell her the apt mind has shown up. The day watchman eyed the Ron in shabby clothes and spoke. Wait here. Chapter 11. Otsudai-sen, the housekeeper. Some time later, Kawa State. The day watchman returned and said, the housekeeper will see you. You really should have made yourself more presentable before you saw her. Time is of an essence when it comes to mysteries. The Ronin stated. The Ronin and Rico were shown to a large rectangular room. At one end, there was a raised platform with two levels above the floor. On the highest level, there were two chairs where Governor Fujita and the First Lady would sit. The chairs were empty as the governor and his wife were not there. An older woman with a streak of white hair through her black hair stood on the second highest level before the two chairs, but off to the side. The Ronin noticed twin maids stood beside the housekeeper but not on the raised platform. The Ronin also noticed one of them had a slight reddish mark across her neck. A man was also there with a Pomeranian sitting at his feet. The Ronin guessed the man was a dog breeder. There was also another man there clad in armor and most likely the highest ranking warrior under the governor. I am Otsudai-sen, the housekeeper. The older woman with a streak of white hair spoke. And then she motioned to the twin maids and said, This is Cade, the lady's maid, and her sister, Kaden, the head maid. She motioned to the two men and introduced them. This is Iki, the master of the kennels, and Jocko, the captain of the guards. Otsudai-sen paused as she looked over the two, who had been presented to her, and then the housekeeper spoke, You do not look like Lord Tante. You look more like a vagabond than the famous samurai detective. I am not Lord Tante. The Ronin spoke. The housekeeper glanced at the captain of the guards, and then she said to the Ronin, I thought you said that you were the samurai detective. I actually said I was the apt mind you were waiting on. The housekeeper informed the Ronin, I only want Lord Tante. Lord Tante will not be here for another two hours. His Norimono broke down on the way here. You could wait for him or you could tell me your problem while you wait and just maybe I will prove myself to you before Lord Tante even shows up. 
I will not charge you for solving one of your problems. One of my problems, the housekeeper repeated. I did not say that I had more than one problem. No, but I did notice that you have summoned two of your maids, the captain of the guards, and the master of the kennels, the Ron and said, outside of someone being murdered, I am not sure how the four of them could be connected. You are correct that I have more than one mystery that must be solved. Rico leaned to the Ronin and whispered, How did you do that? Lucky guess, the Ronin whispered back. I had a 50-50 chance that I was right. Hopefully, it will pay off. The housekeeper eyed the Ronin and the boy with him. And then she said, I should have you thrown out, but I will test this apt mind you boast of. I have two mysteries for you to solve. The first mystery is that Our Lady's black pearl necklace has gone missing. It was last seen in her jewelry box two nights ago. I believe it was stolen by one of the servants. The second mystery is, before you tell me this second mystery, I believe I have already solved your first mystery. The Ron and spoke. It is my guess that Cade was admiring her lady's necklace and tried it on. Her sister Cadden must have walked in on her and scolded her. I believe there was a fight and the necklace was accidentally ripped from Cade's neck causing the marks I see. The Ron and stated, pointing at the lady's maid. Cade moved her hand to her neck to try and hide the marks. Cadden probably didn't want to get her sister or herself in trouble. So they picked up all the pearls but when they went to fix the necklace, they came up several pearls short. They have been looking for the missing pearls since. The housekeeper turned to them and asked, is this true? The twins fell on their knees and begged the housekeeper, please forgive us. The housekeeper turned to the Ronin and said, you solved this mystery without questioning a soul. You do have an apt mind. Do you know where the missing pearls could be? The Ronin motioned to a wall and said, I noticed the dog painting you have of a Japanese chin. I believe the dog might be the culprit. Someone will have to check its poop the next few days. You can't say that in front of the women. Rico scolded the Ronin. I can't say what. Poop. Should I have said crap instead or maybe dung? I guess I could have used excrement or maybe even fecal matter. The Ronin thought about it and said, Oh, I know better yet. Feces or manure but when I think of manure, I think of horses or cattle and not a dog. I guess I could have just said number two. Rico said, I think stool would have been finer just saying they only had to wait until the dog went to the bathroom. Actually, the housekeeper started as she cleared her throat to interrupt their discussion of poop. The female dog in the painting is a purebred Japanese chin, and she has gone missing. Lord Sato is on his way here with his prize-winning male, and the two are to be bred. A purebred Japanese chin, the Ronin repeated, glancing at the painting of the black and white lap dog. How long before Lord Sato arrives? Five days from now, the housekeeper replied. The Ronin said, I will endeavor to have the mystery solved before then and have the first lady's dog safely returned. What should I tell Lord Tante when he arrives? Tell him you have put this mystery to a contest, one apt mind against another. What is your name? The Ronin glanced at Rico and then answered, Horosha. Stay as our guest, Horosha. The housekeeper spoke. You and your apprentice. I accept your hospitality. Follow me, and I will show you to your room. The housekeeper spoke, glanced at the twins, and said, Cadden and Cade, you two stay here until I return. Chapter 12. A similar accident. The housekeeper showed Horosha and Rico to a room and once the housekeeper left, Rico inquired, how did you know about the pearl necklace? Horosha smiled as a memory from the past became vividly clear and then said, I had a similar accident with my own mother's necklace. Rico tilted his head and then muttered, why were you wearing your mother's necklace? Horosha ignored him and said, we should use every hospitality that has been offered to us and take a bath. I bet they have a hot spring here. What about the other mystery? How are you going to solve it and still find Asahi the bodyguard? I actually already know what happened to the dog. I just haven't figured out where the dog is. Really? Rico questioned. The housekeeper said that Lord Sato was on his way here to breed his prize winning male with their female. The only thing is, their female dog is no purebred. Did you notice the eyes of the dog in the painting? They are more Pomeranian than Japanese chin. Her eyes have given away who one of her parents is. I believe Icky took the first lady's dog and either hit it or killed it so that a certain indiscretion wouldn't be found out. Icky is probably afraid he'll lose his job or worse if the first lady's dog is revealed not to be a purebred. Why didn't you tell the housekeeper? We can now freely move about the governor's estate and ask questions. I can get close to the first lady and her bodyguard without arousing any suspicions. Horo Shai answered and motioned to their room. We also will have a soft futon to sleep on while we are here. I also imagine food and a hot bath I can't wait to slip into. Rico was also looking forward to sleeping on a futon and not the hard ground he usually slept on in some alley. Horosha removed the bamboo hat and set it in the corner of their room. Rico questioned, what about Lord Tante? I imagine he is a smart guy. 
He can probably solve the mystery in a few days and prove that he is an exceptional detective. Horo Shaw went to the shoji in the back, slid the divider to the side, and peered outside. I was right. We have our own personal bath. Rico, stay in the room. I am going to get my bath first. There was a knock from the corridor, and one of the twins opened the shoji and set some things in their room. Horo Shaw thanked her, and the maid left. Why do you want me to stay in the room? Rico asked. You are a boy, but I think you are too old to bathe with me. Horo Shaw answered and then added. After all, we are not siblings. What does that have to do with anything? Rico questioned. Are you one of those shy men who can't get naked in front of other men? No, Horo Shaw replied. I'm just not a man. Hot Spring Haiku, Second Vice of Mine, Soothe Weary Body and Soul, Mineral Water, Chapter 13. What do you mean you are not a man? What do you mean you are not a man? Rico yelled. I am a woman, Horo Shaw spoke as she readied her bathing items that Cadden had brought them. You can't be a woman, Rico insisted. You were once a samurai. There have been great women samurai throughout our history, Horo Shaw said. Only a few, but they don't count. They just took over the title from their husband when he passed on and they had no son to take the title. Look, Cadden also brought us a change of clothes. Good, mine was a little too full of holes and slashes. Horo Shaw spoke as she put a few fingers through the cloth with a slash through it. Kaido nearly made ribbons out of my kimono when he slashed me. Why would your clothes be full of slashes? Rico questioned, and then the boy stated. So he did cut you or at least your clothes. How did you survive his lightning strike? She put a finger to her lips and winked at him as she answered. It's a secret. Fine. If you don't want to tell me, Rico spoke in a huff, and then he muttered, don't trust me. The boy made a face as he stared at her, trying to figure out how he didn't notice. Him, who usually noticed everything. If he let the tiniest detail elude him, in his world, it could mean a meal lost or a life lost. Rico said, I want to go back to the question of how you can be a woman. I was born that way. Okay, I wasn't born a woman. Horo Shah motioned with her fingers as if she was pinching something to show its small size. And then she said as if speaking to an infant, First, I was this little seedling of a baby. Her arms exploded in a wide circle as if she was the rising sun. And then she continued, dot 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 then I sprouted up into this little girl. Horo Shah put both hands on her hips and stood there like some heroic statue as she finished. Dot 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 and then I blossomed into a woman. Are you some sort of plant? He muttered. Horo Shah ignored his comment as she insisted. I wasn't keeping it a secret. She looked down at herself and said, I guess I do dress more like a man. The clothing is easier to travel in and fight in when I need to. She grabbed a hold of her breasts underneath her kimono as she added. And my femininity really doesn't stick out, but I wasn't keeping my gender a secret. Horo Shah peered at the boy and asked him, Have I answered your question? Can I go get my bath now? Rico ruffled his dark black hair and said as if he would scream, This is just making my head explode like a firecracker. He dropped his hands and said as if he was disappointed, I thought you were this great samurai. I even witnessed you take on Kaido and win against his lightning strike. Did some great samurai teach you? Not exactly, she answered. I was taught the sword from a reluctant emotional samurai, but my skill is more of a blessing. Rico yawned and said, I don't think I understand. It's fine. I really don't understand myself. For so long, I thought it was a curse as my blessing has some limitations to it. She turned to the boy and for a moment, she saw her brother again. Horo Shah told him, I'm really tired. I'm going ahead and getting my bath, and then I will go to bed. She mumbled as she watched Rico spread out their futons on the wooden floor where they would sleep. My head hasn't laid on a pillow in so long. You can get your bath once I'm done. Chapter 14. A Dream and a Nightmare. Some time later after they had both had their baths, the two slept soundly in their room. Horo Shah slept closest to the shoji that led to the small hot spring as she dreamed of owning her own hot springs resort one day. Her dream brought a smile to her face but then a different dream invaded her peaceful thoughts and brought with it the black hand of death and the guilt of surviving. She gripped at her cover in the throes of an ordeal of the mind and hard as a nightmare seized her. The specter of her past frequently visited her at night and brought with it horrors she wished to forget. Twelve years earlier, Rico, the son of the samurai, glanced back at his two sisters as their home burned around them. He placed one hand on his wound the ninja had inflicted and stretched out his other hand toward his beloved siblings, as if to grasp them one last time. His face wrinkled with pain as he uttered, Sisters, Sakura took a step toward him to grab his hand as his face ashened, but then he fell face down to the floor. She screamed, You killed my brother. You killed Rico. Don't scream at me. The lead ninja yelled at her. The boy cut me. You killed my brother. 
Sekira continued to scream. You killed him. You killed my brother. The screams became louder and then were drowned out by the roar of fire as the room disappeared, swallowed by flames. A monstrous face appeared in the flames, a face like that of a demon lion that haunted her memory both waking and those of dreams. Her heart thundered in her chest as the drums of war sounded all around her. She let out a scream. The present. Horosha sat up in bed as she screamed out, Rico. I'm here. The street boy spoke as the darkness of night still surrounded them. Why are you crying out my name? She glanced around the area and saw no fire and smelled no smoke. Horosha pulled from her hellish dream and caused the tormenting specter to flee back into her mind. The dark phantom of history would not let her rest. She finally answered the boy. I was having a nightmare and calling out my brother's name. The one who was massacred along with the rest of your family. Yes, she spoke softly. I will kill the one responsible. I will make him pay with his life. I will only get one chance. I will find the sole person responsible. And I will kill him with my father's sword. Horosha removed the mother of pearl comb with the daffodil on it as she thought of her sister. I will avenge both of my siblings. She laid back down and told him, go back to sleep. There is much for us to do tomorrow. Chapter 15. Young Horosha. Horosha gripped her cover as she found it hard to return to sleep when the relentless specter was pressing against her skull to enter her dreams again. She turned over and thought about how she had arrived here, the choices she had made, and the people who had helped her. About five years after the fire and massacre that took her family away from her, young Horosha held a bakken, a wooden practice sword, as she faced Hanju, a samurai who had retired and spent his time teaching exceptional students or more like he was still looking for that exceptional student. The two of them faced off in a practice duel. Hanju was also armed with a bakken. She had already been practicing for over an hour. Her hands and forearms were bruised from earlier training sessions. Hanju held high his sword and charged his pupil. Young Horosha backed up a few steps and nearly fell down in her retreat, and Hanju easily stripped the sword from her. Hanju frowned, then turned to the woman watching them, and spoke, Keikenna, she will never learn this. It would be better to tell her to give up. I have never seen a student with less raw talent than her. I don't know if I can teach her, Kenjutsu. It would be better that she give up this idea of taking revenge. Keikenna sighed and then said, you tell her that. I have tried. Hanju turned to young Horosha and instructed her, give up and go home. I have no home, she told him. It was burned to the ground. He instructed her, go find you a husband then and start your own family. He will provide for you. How can I start a family when my old family's ghosts are calling out to me from the grave? I am from the house of Shakadzuru. I am from a proud samurai family, and the blood of my father and siblings calls for revenge. You don't even know who is responsible for killing your family, Hanju told her. I already have a few clues, but I can't take my revenge until I can kill the ones responsible with my own hand. I need to learn the sword. It is the samurai way. Keikenna, help me out here. I'm too old to argue. The priestess questioned him, is it that you are too old or that you are getting a little frustrated because you haven't come across your star pupil? I can admit that I am frustrated. I have been retired three years and still have to find one who is exceptional for me to teach all my techniques to. Is that a tear that I see in your eye? Keikenna inquired of him. It is no tear. Hanju yelled at her as he wiped his eye. Stop saying that I have a tear in my eye. My nickname is all your fault. I wanted to be known as Hanju, the sword crippler or Hanju, the paralyzer but only your nickname stuck. Keikenna mumbled with a devious grin on her face. Hanju, the crying samurai. What did you say, you disgraced priestess? Nothing, she grumbled under her breath. She had been dismissed from her order long before she came to work for the house of Shakajiru, but it still stung when people referred to her as so. Keikenna questioned him, what will you do now? Now I will have to think about whether or not I will drop her as my pupil. I will give you my decision tomorrow, Hanju spoke, and then he left. Young Horosha slowly walked over to her bakken and picked it up. She went and sat next to her father's sword which was beside Keikenna. I will not give up, she said, even if the crying samurai drops me as his pupil. I will not give up. I will find me another sensei to teach me. Keikenna leaned over, wrapped her arm around her, and asked, what do you think your greatest weakness is? What do you mean? When you are fighting as with Hanju, what is your greatest weakness? She thought about it, and then young Horosha answered, I am afraid. Fear can be a weakness, Keikenna said as she peered at the one beside her who she loved like she was her own daughter. Keikenna peered at her own hand, and then she said, Since I owe a lot to the house of Shakajiru, I will grant you a blessing. I rarely use my gifts, but I will use it on you. I will ask the creator of everything to bestow a blessing on you to help you in your quest, but first, I must teach you something. Hand me your father's sword. Young Horo shot it as instructed. The priestess asked her as she held up the scabbard. What do you see here? 
a means to take my revenge. Keikenna told her, your father's sword has two sides. A katana isn't a double-edged blade, young Horosha insisted. Listen to me, Keikenna instructed her as she unsheathed the blade. She ran her fingers along the edge of the sword as she said, your father's sword has a side that is very sharp, and it can take and defend lives. The priestess turned over the sword and ran her finger along its other side as she stated, your father's sword also has a blunt side that's dull and has no edge, and it can show mercy and forgiveness. I don't understand. Why would I want to forgive anyone who has wronged me? We are all human and make mistakes. When someone wrongs us and the wrong is great, we become bitter toward them. Our own soul is hurt by this bitterness, and the bitterness will continue to hurt us until we can let go of these ill feelings toward the offense. If we forgive, truly forgive, we can work toward healing our soul. What if the person does not ask for forgiveness? You still need to forgive them for your own sake, the priestess told her. The one who hurt you can go through life not even thinking about the wrong they committed against you. You might be left alone in keeping the memory of the wrong alive. You might have to forgive someone who does not want your forgiveness or does not ask for it. I will consider what you have told me, young Horosha said. Do more than consider it. You should live by it and you will be more content for it, Keikenna told her. The priestess sheathed the sword and set it behind them, and then she put her hand on young Horosha's forehead, and said, the one who made everything, give this child a blessing so that she can find her path in this life. Young Horosha sat there and waited under the hand of Keikenna for a long while as the priestess continued to pray for her in incomprehensible murmurs. And then she said, I don't feel any different. Are you sure your gifts still work? It has been a long, long, long time since you used them. Sometimes, I wonder why I even put up with you, Keikenna told her. Maybe I will just take my blessing back. No, no, young Horosha said as she jumped up. I'll keep my blessing. She clasped her hands behind her back and then rocked back and forth on her feet. Young Horosha did this for about half a minute as Keikenna watched her, and young Horosha did this until the angry look on the priestess' face vanished. And then she asked her, what sort of blessing did you give me? I do not know, Keikenna replied as she patted the floor next to her. Young Horosha retook her seat as the priestess spoke. Maybe the creator will give me a dream and reveal the blessing to me. It would be helpful to know. Somehow, I have to convince the crying samurai that I am the pupil he has been waiting on. Tea haiku. Tea with only you. Time well spent. Dark brew. Teacup. Warmth. Love. Care. Us. Home. Chapter 16. An Arori. The next morning, young Horosha and the priestess sat around an Arori within their small hut. It was a traditional Japanese sunken hearth and used for heating the home and for cooking. The Arori was square-shaped and cut right in the wooden floor, and stones lined the pit. It was equipped with an adjustable patha called a Jizekagi, and the patha consisted of an iron rod within a bamboo tube which was used for raising and lowering a suspended pot or kettle by an attached lever which was decoratively designed in the shape of a fish. Keikenna removed a small cast iron pot from the patha it was hanging from with a towel. She set the pot to the side, grabbed a set of chopsticks, grabbed a piece of seaweed from the miso soup, and tasted it. It's done. Eat up. There is much for you to accomplish today, and you will need your strength. The two of them dug into the dried fish that had been grilled over the charcoal fire. They also had rice and miso soup for their breakfast. They ate for a few minutes, and then young Horosha asked, Do you know of a way for me to convince Sensei Hanju to remain my teacher? I believe I do, the priestess answered her. I had a dream last night, and I was shown what sort of blessing the creator placed upon you. Young Horosha's eyes twinkled as she questioned, Will I become the most skilled samurai of all time? Keikenna laughed and then answered, I'm afraid not. Your skills will remain as they are unless you train. So by working hard, I will become the most skilled samurai of all time and kill the people who took my family away from me. She questioned. As Hanju said, it is doubtful you will be an excellent samurai. You can become a good samurai with training, but your sword skills will not rise to fame. What sort of blessing did you give me if not to vanquish my foes with father's sword? First, I must tell you that the blessing the creator gave you also comes with a two-layer curse of swords. The first curse or condition of this blessing is that once you have murdered someone, you will no longer have this blessing. One person, young Horosha spoke. I can only kill one person. She had seen many faceless persons who could have instigated such an attack against her family. Young Horosha knew there were many but now that many had to become one. And she said, it is fine. As long as I can kill the one person who ultimately was responsible for massacring my family, I will be satisfied. What is the second curse of sorts that you mentioned? Keikenna removed a small dagger as she moved around the sunken hearth as if to attack her. And then the priestess said, let me explain. Chapter 17, Obsessed with the Hot Spring. 
the present. Horosha and Rico rose early the next morning, and as she had said, there was much for them to do. She suggested that they take turns having another bath. Rico believed she was obsessed with the hot spring for she took far too long to have her bath and he had to wait in the room with nothing to do, waiting on his turn which he decided to pass on. He had his bath for the week. Actually, he was happy as long as he had a bath once every two weeks. The next thing they did was to go and have breakfast. They were served along with Lord Tante and his entourage. None of those with the samurai detective looked too happy that the two vagabond intruders were there, and Lord Tante kept glaring at her. They didn't worry about them for long for a large spread was put before them. Servants came in and set dishes on their small individual tables that were kind of like trays. Everyone sat on floor pillows. Rico had never seen so much food before. Their immense breakfast consisted of steamed rice, miso soup with clams, salted salmon, tsukumono or Japanese pickles, sheets of nori or dried seasoned seaweed, natto or fermented soybeans, quick pickles made from the long, thin, and spiny Japanese cucumber, and blanched spinach. Horosha and Rico ate and ate and even asked for seconds on the bowl of rice. After they had been there for over 15 minutes, Lord Tante finally spoke to them. I heard you solved the case of the missing black pearl necklace. I did, Horosha replied through a mouthful of rice she was shoving in her mouth with her chopsticks. Rico leaned over to her and whispered, don't talk with your mouth full. It's very rude. She covered her mouth with her hand, and then she said, it's been so long since I had to worry about my manners. I have not seen you before, Lord Tante continued. And then the elderly samurai asked, what house are you from? Horosha eyed him for a while, and then she answered, my house has fallen into disarray, and its name has been wiped from creation. You are a ronin? Lord Tante uttered. Does Otsudai-sen, the housekeeper, know of this? Surely, she didn't pay one like yourself to come in. I offered my services on the first mystery free of charge. I am a ronin and needed to prove myself. I will receive a fee if I can solve this next mystery. You mean if you can solve it before me? Lord Tante corrected the ronin. I hear that you have an apt mind. Horosha spoke as she tapped her head. It might have been mere luck that I solved the first case. It will be a real test to see if I can solve this next one even if I solve it after your apt mind has solved it. It will be a contest then. Lord Tante spoke as a glint as bright as polished steel flashed in his eyes. A contest of wit and deduction. May the best apt mind win. The elderly samurai felt an excitement he hadn't experienced in many years, and he was feverishly motivated to start the hunt bound in the constraints of logic and hypotheses. He added, I, Lord Tante, the samurai detective versus the gumshu ronin. I don't think I like that name, Horosha quickly spoke. Gumshu isn't as flashy as detective or even private eye. She added, stressing the second word of the second name she had suggested as she pointed at one of her peepers. The elderly samurai was taken aback by the ronin's odd behavior. He tucked that bit of oddness in the back of his head for further study and asked, speaking of names, by what name should I call you? She glanced at Rico and then at the abacus the elderly samurai carried. And then she answered, you can call me Horo. Chapter 18. Jocko, the captain of the guards. Horo Shah and Rico made their way to see Jocko, the captain of the guards, to interview him. They found him among his men as he carried out the daily drills which included archery practice. They watched from a distance and waited until Jocko noticed them. Rico questioned her as they waited, why are we here? I thought you would interview Icky since he is the culprit. I don't want to make Icky nervous. He might do something stupid like kill the dog before I've had a chance to figure out where it is or Icky might kill one or both of us. That would be bad, Rico said as he envisioned the crazed dog breeder slicing and dicing him up in a fit of madness. Horosha waved to the captain when Jocko finally noticed them. Jocko came and met with them. You have some questions for me. Jocko inquired. I do. The housekeeper informed me that you were the one who discovered the dog had gone missing from its kennel. Why were you the one who discovered this and not the master of the kennels? As the first lady's favorite dog, I was put in charge of its keep while its mistress was away. I locked the dog in its kennel for the night and upon my return, the padlock was gone and so was the dog. How many people had a key to the padlock? Only I and Icky, but the padlock could have easily been picked. I never thought that someone could effortlessly move about our security, make their way into the kennel, and take the dog without anyone seeing them. Did you find anything unusual when you searched the dog's kennel? She asked. No. I see, Horosha commented as she considered how she would find the location of the missing dog if the dog was still among the living. She decided she also needed to move her own investigation forward. So she asked, when are the first lady and her bodyguard supposed to return? Why does that matter to your investigation? Jocko questioned. Depending on why the dog was kidnapped, the importance of your lady's return could be very valuable information. 
The first lady and her bodyguard have already returned. Could you or the housekeeper make arrangements so that I can speak with her? Of course, Jocko replied. If the first lady is willing to see you. She nodded and then turned to leave. One moment, Jocko spoke. I do remember something from my inspection of the kennel. I found the flower of a red clover among the hay. Why did this catch your attention? The red clover grows nowhere on the governor's estate, Jocko answered. It only grows deep in the Midori forest that is on the other side of the Yurikobai River that borders the estate. An herbalist used to live there in his hut, but he died a few years ago. The place is now abandoned. Chapter 19 The First Lady Later that day, Jocko escorted the Ronin and the boy to the room they had first met the housekeeper in, and the captain of the guards waited to present them to the First Lady. The First Lady hadn't come in yet. The room was very big and filled with many things. Horosha looked around at everything while they waited. She had learned that Governor Fujita had gone to see Lord Gima, who now lorded over the Kai province since the downfall of the House of Shakajuru and the death of Lord Shakajuru Haruto, her father. It caused her great anguish to hear such things repeated, and Horosha wept deep within herself to be reminded of her family's demise. She also learned Governor Fujita wouldn't be back for some time. The captain of the guard stood off to the side. Riko leaned to Horosha and told her, especially mind your manners in front of the governor's wife. I do not want to lose my head over something that you did. Horosha nodded as she continued to look around the room at the many decorations. She noticed more than a dozen vases sitting on stands that were of great value. The vases reminded her of her own home when she still lived with her siblings and her father. Soon, the first lady entered along with her bodyguard, who paid special attention to the ranin and the boy. The first lady, who wore a kimono covered with gold moths, went and took her seat that was on the second level of the raised platform. Horosha's heart thundered in her chest, and she found it hard to breathe. The first lady spoke as if she had better things to do than to converse with Aranen. They say your name is Horosha. She stared at the first lady in disbelief. They say that you are here to find my dog, Yoke. Horosha blurted, you named your dog, Yoke. Yes, what of it? The first lady asked, wondering what business it was of the Aranen. The first lady sat there waiting on some answers, and then she said, you have not answered any of my questions. Horosha found that disbelief and undeniable surprise had muted her tongue as so many things swirled in her mind. The black pearl necklace, the dog, a bodyguard that once worked for her family, and an estate far from her family's lands. How did this all fit in? If you will not answer my questions, I will not answer yours, the first lady stated, waved for the captain of their guards, and said, take this rude Ronin and the boy. It was like a miracle had happened, and the tongue that had gotten mute exploded forth with one word. Sakura. The first lady froze when she heard her given name. She had not noticed the Ronin's mannerisms before when they spoke, but when the Ronin said her name, Sakura appeared at the shocked Ronin in equal disbelief. Clear the room, the first lady ordered. Jocko bowed to the first lady and started out. The bodyguard, Asahi, did not start out as instructed. Leave us, the first lady spoke once more but in anger for having to repeat herself. Asahi wanted to know why the Ronin was there. He had heard Horosha came in to solve a mystery, but the runny Ronin seemed to be surrounded by his own mysteries. Asahi also needed to keep close tabs on the oldest daughter of the fallen house of Shakajiru. If the captain of the guards hadn't been there, he might have ignored her order. Asahi begrudgingly headed for the exit and left along with Jocko. Sakura waited until they both left, and then she stood and took a couple of steps down from the platform toward the Ronin. She asked, Is it really you? Horosha said, You're alive. I thought you were dead and with our brother, but you were alive? I also thought you were dead, Sakura said as she walked the distance between them. Is it really you? You don't look like my little sister. Have I changed that much? Horosha questioned. Sakura went and grabbed hold of her little sister's face and peered at her intently. It is you, Yoke. What happened to you? I want to know the same about you. I thought you died in the fire. I was saved, Sakura stated as if ashamed of the fact. It would seem that you were also saved. She took a moment to think about the consequences of such a discovery. And then Sakura murmured, How am I going to explain this to my husband? Her voice rose as she spoke. You can't stay here unless I explain what happened to me in the past. No need, Horosha said as she clasped both of her older sister's hands in hers. I already have a cover that will allow me to stay here a few days. Horosha glanced at Riko and added, I also have a very loyal assistant who will assist me in my ruse. I have nearly located your missing dog. 
and after I have presented your dog to you, and your husband has returned, I will simply request that I am reappointed as a provisional samurai as a reward for solving the mystery. If my request is granted, I can stay here without rousing any suspicions and still work toward finding out who. Someone knocked at the door. Sakura stepped back from her little sister and said, Come in. The housekeeper walked in and stood just on the other side of the doors. Yes, what is it, Otsudai-san? I have received news that the governor will be returning earlier than planned. I see, Sekira spoke. Make preparations. I also need to attend to some things. The housekeeper bowed and left. Sekira said, Our reunion will have to wait. There is much we need to talk about and much I need to learn from you. Go now, my precocious little sister, and see if you can track down my missing dog. You already knew your dog was missing. It is hard to keep a secret in this household, Sekira told her. Before I go, Horosha began, Did you really name your dog? Yoke. I did. She reminded me of you in so many ways. I just had to name her. Yoke. Now go and find the one who is your namesake. I will. I believe all I have to do now is go for a long stroll. Surprise haiku. It could not be true. Heart pounding. Eyes wide open. Frighteningly sweet. Chapter 20. Lord Tante. Horosha along with Rico headed for their room. She instructed the boy not to speak about what he heard unless they were alone. They were nearly to their room when Lord Tante, with his abacus in hand, blocked their path along with his entourage. I heard you spoke with the first lady, Lord Tante spoke as if accusing the Ronin of a crime. I did, she replied. The first lady will not give me an audience. Are you obstructing my investigation so that you will win our contest? Lord Tante questioned the Ronin. The governor is returning early from his trip, so I was quickly ushered out of our meeting. The first lady knows that her dog is missing. I didn't acquire any more information than that because, as I said, I was ordered to leave. I still have several questions for Sekira. You said Sekira, not First Lady Fujita, Lord Tante pointed out. And then he asked, are you an old acquaintance of hers or maybe a former lover or current lover? She does love me, Horosha spoke, drifting into her daydreams like she used to do as a child. Horosha was so glad that she had found her sister alive and well. Rico elbowed her and warned her, watch what you say. Oh, right? There is something up with you, and I will find out what it is, and I will expose whatever it is, Lord Tante declared with fervor. I am not known as the samurai detective for. Horosha let out a squeal and dropped down to her knees. Lord Tante was immediately taken aback and said, You do not have to prostrate yourself before me. Though, it is a very poor prostrate position. You really should have your head bowed low to the ground. The elderly samurai waved his hand as if erasing his last comment. And then he spoke, No matter, Concede that I am the better detective, and I will not reveal yours and the first lady's indiscretions. You're so cute. Horosha spoke as if talking to a baby, and then she stretched out her arms. Now see here, Lord Tante uttered. I do not see how my attractiveness matters in this situation. I have always been a handsome man, and I will not have you talk to me in such a manner as to distract. A small ball of fur ran past his legs and into the outstretched arms of the ronin. It's a puppy, Horosha squealed for a second time. Isn't he so cute? Icky, the master of the kennels came running around the corner and shouted. There you are. Horosha straightened as she held the puppy to her face and smushed him all over her cheek as the puppy excitedly barked and licked her. She moved past the elderly samurai, who was dumbfounded. And she approached Icky and said, he's so fluffy. He's a Pomeranian, isn't he? Good eye. I sired my best male Pomeranian out and just went and had my pick of the litter. She asked, are all the dogs in your kennel prize dogs? Yes, the estate's kennels is the envy of the region, Icky stated with pride. Horosha reluctantly handed the puppy to the master of the kennels, and Icky took the ball of fur back with him. Horosha turned back to the elderly samurai and asked, What were we talking about? I was talking about not revealing your secret, Lord Tante answered all red in the face. But I believe I will retract my offer. I believe I have discovered your true secret. He leaned to her and whispered, You are no ronin or samurai. You are actually a woman. Lord Tante continued on his way and his entourage followed a little perplexed and unsure what their lord had discovered about the ronin. Lord Tante said, I am now very intrigued and so should you be. What will I do with this secret I have discovered? Rico questioned her after the samurai detective and his entourage left. What will you do now? She sighed and answered, Now I will have to wrap things up before he figures out what happened to Sakura's dog and the dog's location. I need the good graces of the governor so that the two of us can stay and finish our investigation of the bodyguard. I would say that you only want to stay because of their hot spring. There is that too, she admitted. You must be so shocked that your sister is alive, Rico spoke. I am, and I'm also so grateful. It would seem the creator answered my unspoken prayer. Now, 
It looks like you will have to go on that stroll I had planned for us, and you will have to go alone. I have other things I must do. Where am I going? He asked, to find a few herbs. Chapter 21 Runny Ronan Horosha found out where Lord Tante's room was from the head maid. Cadden. She headed to his room to tell him she had solved the mystery so that they could all gather and she could present her findings to the housekeeper. Horosha paused just outside his room and overheard a conversation from within. Lord Tante, you need to solve this mystery before the Rundi Ronan does. Our overlord only keeps you on retainer because you solve mysteries for his province and the surrounding provinces. You have failed to solve the last three cases you were hired to solve. I have been able to keep the failures from getting out but if you fail again, I do not think I can keep it from reaching the ear of our overlord. Think of your granddaughter. Since your son-in-law and daughter died, you have been her sole provider. I know, I nearly have this mystery figured out. I believe I have been distracted by the gumshoe Ronan. I just need another day. By yourself this day, his assistant told him. What are you saying I should do? You have not told me what it is, but I think you should use the secret you learned about the Ronan. Buy yourself some time to solve this mystery. I will divulge the secret if it is the right thing to do, not so that I can buy myself some more time. If I cannot solve this case on my own merit, Lord Tante, Horosha called out. I believe I have solved the mystery. Come with me as I present my findings to the housekeeper. Chapter 22 The dog is dead and buried. Horosha, Rico, and Lord Tante along with his entourage presented themselves before Otsudai-san, the housekeeper. Otsudai-san said, I hear that one of you has solved the mystery. Horosha started to speak, but Lord Tante spoke before she could. I have solved the mystery. The dog is dead and buried and is located in the garden shed. You are mistaken, Horosha accused him, and then she smiled at the elderly samurai as if he was her grandfather and asked, Don't you remember? You told me before that the dog is still alive. And you were also going to tell the housekeeper that the dog is located in the herbalist abandoned hut that is within the forest that's on the other side of the Yurikobai River. I did. Lord Tante spoke as he glanced at her, and then he turned his attention back to the housekeeper and said, And I also know who the kidnapper is. The bodyguard. Horosha cleared her throat as she stood beside him. And then she whispered, Icky. Lord Tante paused and restated, The master of the kennels is the culprit. Why would Icky have kidnapped the dog? The housekeeper questioned. Lord Tante had no clue and wondered if Horo had somehow tricked him into accusing the wrong man as he spoke. The master of the kennels kidnapped the dog because... Because... Horo Shah leaned to him and said, Come on. You have an apt mind so use it. I'll give you a hint. Take a look at the painting of the Japanese chin. Lord Tante did so and noticed something he had overlooked before. And then he said, I believe the master of the kennels took the missing dog because he was afraid that once Lord Sato arrived a breeder of Japanese chin himself, that he would discover that Yoke is not a purebred. Both twins gasped as the housekeeper angrily turned to Icky and asked him, Is this true? He dropped to his knees and pleaded, Please forgive me. My own dog had an auspicious rendezvous with Yoke's dame while we were breeding her. I would have merely taken the puppy or puppies that were mixed as my own. But the first lady selected Yoke as her own. I was afraid of how the governor would react if he ever found out and so I kept silent all of these years. Please, have mercy on me. Sekura entered the room, petting Yoke, who Rico had retrieved from the herbalist abandoned hut. The boy came in with Sekura and ran over to Horosha. First Lady Fujita, the housekeeper uttered. So Yoke is a mutt, Sekura spoke, and then she asked, Is that what you are trying to say? Iki bowed his head to the ground and said, Please forgive me. You love the puppy so much. I did not want to say anything, and then when I heard that Lord Sato was on his way here with his own dog, I panicked. Please, don't take my head. Master of the Kennels, I already knew that Yoke was a mutt. Sometimes the eyes can tell us a lot about one's parents. Sakura spoke as she glanced at her younger sister. It did not mean that I loved her any less. Horosha noticed the inferring look Sakura gave her. She paused in thought, considering the implications her older sister hinted at. Horosha felt the blood drain from her face as she realized what her older sister was implying, and it pained her heart to hear such a revelation. It couldn't be true. Sakura's father was also her father. Horosha wanted to run out of the room to deal with such harrowing matters of the heart and family, but it would have to wait. Sakura immediately felt guilty as she saw her clever sister's face pale. Her precocious little sister, one who she loved more than herself, was too capable for her own good. No. Sakura was to blame here, and she knew it. She had told herself long ago that she would never reveal this truth to Yoke. It was either a slip of the tongue or some malicious intention she was even keeping from herself. Some sort of bitterness was surfacing within her, and Sekura needed to deal with it. She needed to talk with Yoke but now wasn't the time. Master of the Kennels, Sekura continued. 
I already informed Lord Sato of the lineage of Yoke and that he could still have the pick of the litter which is customary or I would pay him double the dog stud fee. You already knew, my lady. Icky spoke. What about the governor? You let me worry about my husband, Sakura replied. We will also discuss your punishment for kidnapping my dog at another time. You are not going to remove me from my position? Icky questioned. No, our kennel is the envy of the region, thanks to you. I would have no other master of the kennels. Thank you, my lady. Thank you. The housekeeper spoke. Horosha. It would seem that Lord Tante has solved this second mystery. We have no further use of Iran in service so if you would vacate the premises before the sun goes down, we will consider your room and board payment for the time and effort you put in. Of course, she replied as she glanced at her older sister. Horosha turned and headed out as Rico followed. Lord Tante also followed after her. Mystery Haiku. Helping a new friend. Solving mystery. Apt mind. Bow out. Step aside. Chapter 23. Sakura. Her mind was whirling or was it the estate that was spinning? Horosha had to get outside. She quickened her pace and finally emerged outside. Horosha took deep breaths, trying to quiet her confused and weeping heart. Sakura. The one who was always there for her when they were still together as a family. She, her older sister. A storm of memories capsized her mind. Horosha clearly remembered a time when her sister patiently taught her how to serve tea. She remembered mostly spilling the water that wasn't even hot. Young Horosha was so mad at herself for disappointing her big sister, who had worked with her for so long. But Sakura told her she wasn't upset with her. Sakura told her there was nothing she could do that would change her love for her. Horo, Lord Tante spoke, interrupting her remembering. She turned and faced him, surfacing from the memory. What you did in there for me? He started. Why didn't you claim the prize as your own? Her heart slowed and so did her mind so that she could think clearly again. And she replied, I overheard you and your assistant. You have gotten lazy. Rico stood by the entrance and listened in. How so? Lord Tante questioned her. From one apt mind to another, you are blind, but your disability comes from a stagnant life. Lord Tante insisted. Explain plainly. You are so concerned with impressing people that you are missing clues. You enjoy your fame so you focus too much energy on keeping it. Remove the obstacles and your disability will be no more. I understand, he stated, and I thank you again. If you are ever in need of an apt mind, call upon me, Lord Tante told her. And then he went back inside. Are we really leaving? Rico questioned her. For now, yes, Horosha replied. Let us retrieve our items from our room. We will return to the kitchen that is in town, and I will come up with a new plan to get close to the bodyguard. Chapter 24, Yoke. Horosha and Rico headed for their room. Horo, wait. Sakura called after her sister after she had come back into the estate. Horo, wait. She continued to walk away from her older sister until she called after her for a third time. Yoke. Please wait. I didn't mean. I only. I should not have said what I did. Horosha turned to the boy and asked him, Could you please wait for me in our room? He nodded and continued on. Horosha waited until he was some distance away from them, and then she turned and faced her older sister as she asked, Is it true? It is. Horosha forced herself not to cry as she inquired, How long have you known? Since you were about two, Sakura replied. Our mother had an affair with... Don't tell me, Horosha snapped. I don't want to know. Our father is my father. I don't need to hear anyone else's name. As you wish, Sakura said as she set the female dog on the floor, and then she went and wrapped her arms around her little sister. You are my sister. Horosha couldn't hold it in anymore and broke down and cried as she asked. Even though I am a mutt, it does not matter to me, Sakura told her. Do you remember me asking you if you knew that I loved you? I do, Horosha spoke through sobs. You asked me many times, and I would also answer in the same way. I would tell you, as much as I love you. Sakura nodded and then said, I would then ask you, do you know that I love you more than I love myself? She tightly held on to Sakura as her older sister embraced her. In the past, she would look at Sakura as she didn't quite understand her meaning but as the years went by, she realized the deep sentiment that was always attached to those words. I love you as much as you love me, Horosha told her. I love you as much as you love me. Do not leave me then, Sakura told her. Stay. I will tell Otsudai Sen that I am having you stay. Will you tell them that I am your sister? No, I will not tell them that you are a woman either. Keep your guys for now. I actually wasn't hiding it, Horosha said. Do I really pass for a man so easily? Never mind that. You actually never answered the question. Sakura said, you should tell the boy that you are staying. You are now avoiding the question. I am, Sakura admitted and then asked, why did you come here in the first place? I discovered that Asai was the one who unlocked the front gate and let our enemy in. He did, he did, Horosha replied. I came here to find out who gave him the key. Father was the only one who had the key. 
Maybe he killed father and took the key, Horoshaw said. It is a possibility, but I will not know until I talk with him. How will you get him to talk? I will simply ask him and if he will not talk, I will challenge him to a duel. The right of Charanji? Sekira questioned. And then she uttered, he will kill you. Maybe not. I do have a blessing or two up my sleeve. Chapter 25. Calligraphy. Some time later. Come. Come. Sekira urged her little sister as they entered the large room with the raised platform. Why did you want me to come alone? Horosha questioned her. I haven't even gone and told the boy that we're staying. Do you remember when I used to teach you calligraphy? Sekira asked as they walked over to a table that stood off to the side of the room. Horosha looked over the items on the table. Her older sister had set up a brush, an ink stick, paper, and an inkstone. I do, Horosha answered. Keikenna was so flustered with me that she wouldn't teach me so you took on the task. I loved the time we spent together. Come sit, Sekira urged her. Let me see how your skills have developed. She went and sat on the floor pillow before the low table, and then her older sister sat beside her. Horosha remembered they used to share a floor pillow when they went about these lessons. Sekira poured a little water into the inkstone, then took the ink stick and grounded it against the stone, mixing the water with the dried ink that was within the ink stick. Once she finished, Sekira picked up the brush that was made from horse's hair and had a bamboo handle and handed it to her little sister. I haven't picked up a brush in ages, Horosha admitted. Write your name, Sekira urged her. Horosha took the brush, dipped it in the ink, paused, and asked, which of my names, Yoke, Horosha, or Horo? Sekira was stunned to silence by her sister's question of identity, and then she answered, Yoke, of course, silly, who else are you? I have mostly been referred to as Ronan, but I do like my new name that the boy gave me and the one I created out of the name he gave me. You do seem attached to this boy. We have a special bond. I believe I was meant to meet him here in this town. It is almost like, Horosha wanted to say that a ghost from the past was watching out for her through this boy, but she let the matter drop. There, my name. Horosha peered down at her name, Yoke, and she smiled, not with pride but of the fond memories this moment brought to her remembering. Sakura's reaction was also filled with fond memories mixed with a scolding as she said, Yoke, your calligraphy is still atrocious. Actually, I believe you have gotten worse if that is possible. Horosha picked up the slightly wet paper, handed it to her sister, and said, Here, I want you to have the atrocious Yoke. She grabbed hold of the paper and took it from her little sister. Oh, Horosha uttered in a whisper. What is it? I got a paper cut, Horosha replied as she looked at her index finger with a small bleeding cut. I'm so amazed by how these things bleed. She started to put the finger in her mouth, but Sekira scolded her again. Don't do that. Let me bandage it for you. She left and returned some time later with a wooden box filled with medical supplies. Sekira took her sister's hand, put some ointment on the cut, then wrapped it in a white cloth, and tied the ends in a small knot. You gave me a bow, Horosha stated as she looked at the tiny knot. Usually, Keikenda was the one who bandaged me. She is not here, Sekira spoke, and then she asked, How did you survive the fire? I don't know the details, but I do know that Keikenda pulled me out. She had gone to see her sister that day and came back late that night. Keikenda pulled me out and took me to her sister's house, Horosha answered. She couldn't find you, Uriko, but she did find our father's body. In that instance, Horosha thought about what Sekira had inferred about their mother and that she wasn't their father's true daughter. She shook those thoughts from her head. Their father, Haruto, loved her very dearly. It didn't matter if he was her true father or not. Sister, Horosha began. Do you know why our family was attacked? Why they killed our father? Why they burned down our castle estate? Or who among our faithful servants betrayed us? What do you mean by betrayed? Sekira asked. I actually stumbled across Kaido here in town. He was one of the night watchmen under Asai and the one who told me of Asahi's betrayal. As we talked about earlier, Kaido told me that Asahi unlocked the main gate and let our enemy in. The thing is, Sekira interrupted, how did he get our father's key to unlock the front gate and who paid him to do such a thing as to betray our family? Horosha nodded and then said, I would like to speak with Asahi. Could I do that? Let's say, tomorrow. There are a few things I must do before I can face him in a duel. Give me some time and I will arrange it, her older sister replied. Go, and I will summon you back tomorrow. Horosha leaned over and kissed her sister on the cheek, and then she left. Sakura put a hand to her cheek, embracing the area of her sister's affectionate peck. A few moments later, she peered down at the paper stained on the edge with a little of Yoke's blood. Her expression darkened as Sakura stared at the paper marked by black and soiled with her sister's name, and she mumbled, You were right before. Your name is an atrocious name. Calligraphy Haiku. 
black on white paper, hand steady, dark marks of care, hidden resentment. Chapter 26. The dog, Yoke. Asahi entered and bowed before the first lady, who was playing with the dog, Yoke, and then he asked, What have you learned? The disgraced priestess is the one who pulled her out of my family's burning castle estate. Sekura answered as she kept her eyes on the not-so-loyal bodyguard. Keikenna was always a meddlesome woman. Should I kill your sister? No, you would also have to assassinate the boy that is with her if no one is to notice her absence. I found a way for my sister to stay here. And Yoke has actually proposed a way for you to dispatch of her and no questions will be raised. She is going to issue the right of Cherenji. A sword duel. Asahi spoke, and then he commented, I do not see your sister as much of a challenge for me. Dispatch her and all our problems will be solved. I will summon my sister back with the boy so that there will be a witness to the Cherenji, and no questions will be asked once you have killed her. The bodyguard noticed that the first lady seemed to be thinking of something, and he inquired, What is it? Yoke wanted to wait until tomorrow. She said she wanted to make some preparations before the duel. Do not allow her such time, Asahi told her. You should summon her now. Sakura glared at him as she accused him. You have become very bold of your command of me. She spoke defiantly. You also defied one of my orders right in front of the captain of the guards. You should be mindful of your surroundings or your true allegiance will be discovered by this household. Let me worry about my behavior, he told her. Now summon your sister back. Chapter 27. Cade, the lady's maid. Horo Shah had just arrived back at her room and told Rico that they could stay when Cade, the lady's maid, showed up and instructed them to follow her. One moment, Horo Shah called through the shoji, and then she turned to the boy and stated, We have been summoned too early. I haven't prepared anything. What sort of preparations? Rico questioned her. The kind of preparations that keep me alive. Some time later, they entered the large room as Kate excused herself and went about her work. Sakura and Asahi were the only ones there. The bodyguard stood off to her side on the same level as she sat on her chair upon the raised platform. Sakura nodded to her sister but said nothing to her. What will you do since we were summoned early? Riko whispered. Horosha whispered back. I will start asking and hope I don't have to follow through with my sword. She cleared her throat and then in a loud voice, she said, Asahi, I have a few questions for you. Why should I answer the questions of Iranan? By whose authority do you pose these questions? I have been hired by the house of Shakadzuru. He laughed at her, and then Asahi said, The house of Shakadzuru is no more. Their name has been wiped away. A fallen house cannot rise from the ashes. Horosha held her temper in check as she glanced at her sister and realized Sakura may have hidden her real identity to survive. Asahi didn't seem to know that the first lady was actually Shakadzuru Sakura, the eldest daughter of Lord Shakadzuru Haruto. She decided not to expose her sister and said, Not all of the house of Shakadzuru has perished. At least one remains, and they want answers. Horosha paused to gauge his reaction, but he didn't have one. So she proceeded with her questioning and said, You were tasked on the night of the fire to secure the front gate. How was the gate breached? You have no authority over me, Asahi reaffirmed. I don't need to answer your questions. Horosha considered her next action and then headed for the door to leave. She couldn't face him in a duel, not until she had made all the preparations. Where are you going? Sakura called after her. You must find out what happened to our father. Horosha abruptly stopped. Her sister had just revealed her true identity to the bodyguard if he didn't already know. She wasn't sure if she should leave Sekiro or that she would stay safe if she did leave, so she turned back around. Asahi didn't seem all that surprised by what Sekiro had said. His grim expression hadn't changed since they first came in. Horosha yelled back to her sister as if it would remain a secret. I told you I needed time to prepare. I am not prepared to fight the... Sekiro declared. Horosha invokes the right of Cherenji. The bodyguard moved down the steps to the floor and asked Horosha, Is this true? Are you invoking the right of Cherenji? He then warned her, If you say, No, now, you cannot invoke it at a later time. Horosha wasn't sure if the bodyguard spoke the truth about the right of Cherenji, but she couldn't take the chance that he did speak in truth. I do invoke the right. Asahi grinned and stated, I accept your challenge. We will fight in this room and we will fight now. Riko moved over and stood by Sakura. Horosha glanced at her sister. Nothing was going to plan. Horosha wasn't prepared and she was going up against a very skilled warrior. She could die. For the first time in a long time, she was afraid. It would be her intelligence against his skill. It would be her cunning pitted against his brute force. Asahi drew his sword. Horosha removed her sheath from her sash. The bodyguard noticed she hadn't drawn her weapon yet. So he asked, do you have some sort of quick draw attack like Kaido? And his lightning strike. I don't think I'll give away my secret, she answered him. 
He lifted his sword and went after her. Horosha turned and ran away from him, hiding behind one of the vases on a stand. This is a first. Asahi spoke as he halted his pursuit. I have never had a samurai, even one who has lost their master and must wear the shame of Ranen. Flee from me. I am a bit shy, Horosha told him. It takes me a while to warm up to a duel. Are you mocking me? I don't believe so, she answered, and then turned to Rico and asked the boy, do my actions seem to be mocking him? You are acting like a coward, the boy told her. Of course, he would see it as an insult and that you are mocking him. I did not intend to mock, she spoke, picked up the vase, and threw it at the bodyguard. Asahi ducked it, and the vase crashed to the floor and broke. Horosha ran to the next stand and stood behind its vase. Draw your sword and fight me, Asahi demanded. Even if you are her sister, I will not hold back my mercilessness and I will make you suffer as you die. Horosha glanced at Sekira, and then Horosha picked up another vase and threw it at him. Asahi cut through the vase, and its halves fell to the floor and shattered. Horosha ran to the next vase and stand, and by the time she reached it, Asahi was there. He lifted the sword as she reached for the vase, and he smashed it with the hilt of his sword, sending pottery flying toward her. She lifted her arm to protect her face from the sharp as glass fragments. A few pieces cut her forearms and they bled. Asahi started around the stand for her. Wait, Horosha said as she lifted her hand to stop him. My shyness has gone. We may proceed with the duel. Shall we take our places in the middle of the room? He thought she was trying to pull off some sort of trick. But he nodded and went and took his position in the middle of the room. Asahi wanted to get this fight over with. The boy would also have to be dispatched, but he would wait a few days before doing so. Horosha unsheathed her sword and held the sheath in her other hand as she moved to the middle of the room. Asahi quickly charged and sliced at her to take her head. She slowly blocked, and he quickly countered and cut her across her sword arm. Horosha hit him in the arm with her sheath before he withdrew a few steps. He expected to see blood running from her arm but there was no sign of a wound. Only her clothing had been cut. Asahi attacked again and slashed her several more times as he broke through her poor defenses. He withdrew from her again as she hit him several more times with her sheath. His arms began to tingle but what concerned him more was that he still hadn't drawn any blood. I will warn you, she spoke. You will only have use of your arms for another 30 seconds or so and then you will be at my mercy. Concede defeat and answer my questions and I will return the use of your arms. The tingling in his arms intensified but even they didn't concern him as much as how this woman was evading his attacks. His strokes were true and they made contact each time. He tried to figure out what sort of monster stood before him when he heard the clang of his sword as it hit the wooden floor. Demon, Asahi uttered as he stared at his hands that had just let go of his hilt as if they had a will of their own and refused to obey him. You are a demon, Horosha proceeded with her questioning by saying, I already know you were the one who unlocked the main gate. Tell me where you got the key. Did you kill my father and take it from him or did someone give you the key, demon? He uttered again as he couldn't feel his fingers, hands, or arms. Horosha started toward him as his grim expression turned to one of true fear. He screamed at her, don't kill me. I won't kill you, she told him and then informed him, I have reserved my revenge for one. The one who is ultimately responsible for killing my family. Horosha threatened him, tell me who gave you the key or I will make sure you never hold a sword again. Decision Haiku. Revenge or mercy? My blade must decide which one. Hard in my degree. Chapter 28. Reserved my revenge for one. It was finally here. The moment Horosha had been waiting for so long was finally here. She would learn who slaughtered her family and why, and then she could take her revenge. I won't kill you, Horosha told the bodyguard and then informed him. I have reserved my revenge for one. The one who is ultimately responsible for killing my family. She threatened him, tell me who gave you the key or I will make sure you never hold a sword again. Asahi peered at her older sister with this look that, he was staring at her as if, Horosha shook her head. No, she was mistaken. He wasn't peering at Sekira as if, Horosha continued to shake her head in disbelief. Riko couldn't stand the silence, and the boy yelled, tell us who gave you the key. Horosha sheathed her sword and then went over to the bodyguard and struck him several times with her thumbs. She told him, you will regain the use of your arms in a day or so. Leave before I decide to kill you for opening the gate and allowing all those men to come into my home. Asahi turned and fled the room as if a horde of demons was chasing him. Riko, let's go, she said, making sure not to make eye contact with Sekira. Horosha hurried out of the room as if her own demons were chasing her. The boy ran after her as Sekira was left behind. Where are we going? He called after her. Horosha ignored the boy. He ran after her until he caught up with her in the corridor. And then Riko grabbed her arm and forced her to stop. Where are you going? I don't know, she admitted. I need some air. Towards the end, I couldn't hear what the bodyguard was saying to you. 
Did you learn who gave him the key? Horosha looked as if she would be ill. What did the bodyguard tell you? He said nothing, Horosha replied and then continued on her way. Rico kept in pace with her as he asked. If he said nothing, why are you running away? What did you learn? What could he have said? Who could he have implicated? He upped and stopped as she continued through the corridor. Rico glanced back the way they had come, and then he yelled, You are exactly what you accused Lord Tante of being. She didn't want to hear it and kept running away from the truth. She would just keep walking and nothing would change. Her world wouldn't fracture and fall apart. Rico yelled, You are blind like the samurai detective, but your family is what causes your disability. Horo shopped and stopped as she mumbled, I can't do this. I will be by your side, Rico told her as he came up and took her hand. I can't do this, Horosha said as if she was as weak as a newly born kitten. I can't, the boy said. We have known each other for only a few days, but I believe I know you, Horosha. One who wanders in search of answers. How can you know me? I don't know myself, Rico insisted. I know you, Horo, one with a calculating mind. You will be betraying yourself if you walk away from this without hearing the truth from your sister. It can't be her. It just can't be her. The boy continued, I know you, Yoke, one who is like the dawn and spreads the light of truth over the land. Soak in your own rays. Don't fear them. She turned to the boy and saw her big brother in him. And she asked, you will stay with me, for as long as you want me to. Horosha turned and headed back to her older sister. They had things they needed to talk about. Chapter 29 Rico squeezed her hand. Horosha entered the large room and found Sakura just standing there at the edge of the raised platform, as if they had just left and she was staring after them. You defeated Asai, Sakura spoke. You defeated him. You. The mud of the family. Horosha wanted to run from her sister's presence. But Rico squeezed her hand and gave her the strength to go through with what still needed to be done. She wanted to come right out and ask her if she gave Asahi the key to the front gate. But she decided on another approach to the truth. I came to this town for no particular reason. Horosha began. It was a town like so many I had stayed in or passed through. I posted my usual advertisement and this boy came up to me. He was like many boys I had seen in other towns, Horosha spoke, and then she turned to him and said, Tell her who you are. The boy peered at Horosha, not sure what she was doing. Tell my sister what your name is. I am Rico. Did you hear that? Horosha questioned. Our brother came to me. He wanted me to find you so I am here. Sakura, I am here waiting for you to tell me. Tell me if you were the one. Horosha put a hand over her mouth as she tried to stifle a sob. Tell me if you are the one who. I am the one, Sakura admitted. I am the one who gave Asai the key. I snuck into father's office and took his key. Why would you do such a thing? I was tired of sitting away from father, Sakura confessed. I wanted to sit by his side. I wanted to take over when he died, but I could never do that. I was not a son. I was only a daughter of a samurai. I don't understand. How would betraying our family change that? Ryo, Sakura answered. We knew father would never agree to our marriage. Ryo promised I would have equal power with him in his house. Why did our family have to be slaughtered? It wasn't supposed to happen that way. Asahi was only supposed to allow Ryo in and maybe one other. They were supposed to come and take me away. Once I was safely tucked away at Ryo's castle estate, he could negotiate with father for a marriage contract. I don't know what went wrong. Father wasn't supposed to die. No one was supposed to die. Sakura began to weep, and Horosha went and placed her sheathed sword on the raised platform and hugged her. Horosha looked at the boy and nodded, and Rico left to give the sisters time together. Sakura sobbed in her sister's arms for a long time. And then she said, I'm the reason father is dead. I'm the reason our brother is dead. Horosha didn't know what to say so she held on to her sister tighter, trying to ease her burden. Sakura cried some more and then feeling suffocated, she moved out of her little sister's loving embrace. The evening approached, throwing shadows throughout the large room. Sakura picked up a candle and lit it. There was still plenty of sunlight in the room, but the candle cast a dark shadow across her face. She glanced at the lunar glow moths that decorated her kimono. And then she said, I have always been attracted to fire no matter how dangerous the flame might be. Horosha peered at the candle and realized her sister wasn't actually talking about the flame. She said, you were attracted to Ryo, our father's friend. He was much older than me but still very attractive and ambitious. Ryo convinced me. I allowed him to convince me that I could have a better life with him. I knew he saw more of my mother in me than he actually saw me, but I also knew there was no other way for me to sit by anyone's side. Sakura fisted her hand and said, I no longer wanted to sit apart from father. I didn't want to sit aside of him. I wanted to sit beside him, alongside him. I was the oldest. Why was I never allowed to sit on his right side or even his left? Horosha didn't know what to say to her sister. I was left wanting. Sakura screamed. 
I was isolated from our father's love. She collapsed to the floor, spilling wax to it and questioned, why was I any different than Rico? Our brother. She moved and stood before her older sister, looking down at her grief and regrets. Horoshaw searched for the words to speak, but her thoughts had gotten silent. Do you want to know what is really funny? Sekira questioned her. I never married Rio. I was again cast aside. I crawled my way through the gutter and found a position almost worthy of myself. I may be only a governor's wife, but I do sit beside him and we govern this town together. Sekira rose to her feet as she said. The thing is, she tenderly took her little sister's right arm into her left hand. Yoke smiled at her, and Sekira once again saw the two of them as they once were when their father and brother were still alive. The fond memories floated about her like tiny moths, but then those moths saw a distant flame of discord like the fires that devoured their home. Sekira repeated, the thing is, she quickly thrust her right hand forward, and Horosha felt something hard like metal hit her abdomen. Horosha looked down and saw that her sister had a hold of a dagger. Sakura had taken the dagger, Ryo had given her brother long ago, and she had taken the blade and drove it deep into her sister's stomach. Horosha cried out and grabbed the dagger. Sakura released it and stumbled back. Horosha took a few steps back, holding onto its hilt and crumbled to the floor. I can't have you tell anyone of my betrayal so long ago. Sekira spoke. She took a few more steps away from her sister as Yoke reeled in agony on the floor from the betrayal. I work too hard to gain my position here. I am no longer aside. I am at the right hand of my husband. Horosha looked down at her balled up self, and then she spoke through labored breaths. You had our brother's dagger. I looked everywhere for it. You don't want to talk about that I just plunged a blade into your stomach. Fine. Yes, I had our brother's dagger. I thought it would be a fitting gift for myself, so I took it before the men whisked me away from our home. Sekira glared down at her sister with her hazel eyes and said, With that dagger? Our brother caused his own death. I heard later that the men were instructed to capture us unharmed. But our brother, Rico, struck out at one and cut him across the face. It enraged the man so much he slew our brother. Sekira pointed and said, the dagger Rio gave our brother to help him on his journey only quickly carried him to the afterlife. Horosha continued to grip the hilt of the dagger as she laid in a fetal position on the floor. She didn't know how much time she had left as she peered up from a grave her sister had dug for her. Horosha said, you thought it would be better to kill me than to own up to your mistake. Own up to it. Why would I want to own up to it? I did what I had to in the past just as I now did what I had to. Yoke's head slumped and then completely collapsed to the floor. Sakura gasped as the one she had sworn she loved more than herself had died. She took a few steps toward her little sister. Yoke. Silence followed her inquiry. Yoke. Death had silenced the one whose glee-filled laughter brought the dawn before the sun rose. I killed you. Sakura spoke through sobs. I killed you as I had killed our father and brother. I was the oldest. I was supposed to protect both you and Rico. But I only caused your deaths. I'm a wretched creature. I'm a wicked monster. Chapter 30. Five years after the fire. About five years after the fire and massacre that took her family away from her, Keikenna told young Horosha as they sat around the sunken hearth of their hut, as Hanju said, it is doubtful you will be an excellent samurai. You can become a good samurai with training, but your sword skills will not rise to fame. What sort of blessing did you give me if not to vanquish my foes with father's sword? First, I must tell you that the blessing the creator gave you also comes with a two-layer curse of sorts. The first curse or condition of this blessing is that once you have murdered someone, you will no longer have this blessing. One person, young Horosha spoke. I can only kill one person. It is fine. As long as I can kill the one person who ultimately was responsible for massacring my family, I will be satisfied. What is the second curse of sorts that you mentioned? Keikenna removed a small dagger as she moved around the sunken hearth as if to attack her. And then the priestess said, let me explain. The priestess quickly reached over and grabbed the child's hand and cut her with the blade. Young Horosha pulled back her hand and saw that the small cut on her finger bled. Why did you do that? Do you trust me, Yoke? Not after you just murdered my finger. Keikenna repeated. Do you trust me, Yoke? I do, Ki. Give me back your hand. Keikenna instructed her. She hesitated but then worriedly young Horosha placed her hand in the priestess' outstretched palm. The second curse is simple. Keikenna explained as she took the knife again and cut across a different finger. You first must be cut before your blessing takes effect. Young Horosha looked at her second finger and saw that the blade didn't cut her. Let me see the knife. Young Horosha took the knife and sliced her hand, and the slight wound bled. She took the knife again and attempted to cut herself once more, but the blade wouldn't cut her. One cut, young Horosha spoke. My blessed technique will be called one cut. Do not forget it is a two-part curse. Keikenna warned her. 
First, you must be cut by the person and then they can't harm you. Second, once you murder someone, the blessing will be removed. I understand, young Horosha said. The priestess told her, any cut, no matter how small, will invoke the blessing. Ki, don't call me that, Keikenna spoke. I don't know how many times I have told you. Young Horosha tenderly took her hand and said, thank you. You and the crying samurai are now my family. You have always taken care of me, you and Sakura, but now I only have you. Watch what you say or you might make this old priestess cry. Keikenna wiped a tear from her own eye and said, Do not forget it is a two-part curse. I understand, young Horosha repeated. I can now take my revenge, but I must be patient and find the sole person responsible for the massacre. I can only kill one person, so I must make sure they are the one who is ultimately accountable. Chapter 31, Unblemished Dagger, The Present Horosha placed the unblemished dagger. Sekira had thrust into her belly, to the side on the floor and quietly rose to her feet as her sister wept bitterly. Horosha was right before her. She didn't have much time left. The time had come for her to deal with her sister. Horosha took the grave her sister had dug for her, and she rose out of it like a vengeful ghost. She moved toward her older sister and just as her brother, Riko, had done so long ago. Yoke picked up her father's sword and drew its blade. Sakura looked up and thought she saw an apparition of her sister standing before her, and she uttered, How? Maybe I have been dead all of this time and just came to take my revenge. Yoke told her. Sakura scurried back across the wooden floor and uttered, Asahi was right. You are a demon. My soul is not at rest, Yoke began. I must quell my bloodlust. Then strike me down. Sakura screamed. Strike me down with father's sword. Yoke replied in a calm voice, I will, but only after you have satisfied my curiosity. What do you want to know, nightmarish specter from my past? Do you want to know if I killed father to acquire the key? Yes, I slew him while he slept. I do not believe you. Remember, as a ghost, I have access to the mysteries of the universe. Sakura stared at her with eyes red from crying. And then she said, I did not kill our father. He was not in his room or his office when I went in search of him that night. I only found his key sitting on his table. She stared up at the phantom of her sister, and Sekira asked, What questions do you require of me? Only one more, Yoke replied and then knelt before her older sister as she held their father's sword out to the side as if to slay her. Yoke asked, Did you ever love me? Sekira started to sob, and then she replied, What do you think? I hated you the moment you were born. The same moment our mother died. Sekira grabbed a hold of her little sister's kimono which was in shreds from Asaha's duel with her earlier. And Sakura screamed, you killed our mother, you. The indiscretion of our mother, Yoke's lips trembled, and then she started to cry. Your little body just had to come out. It didn't matter that our mother was too weak. What do you think, little monster? You killed our mother, you took her away from us. Yoke continued to cry, and then she managed to say through sobs, and you killed my mother? So we are even, you killed my mother. What are you talking about? I already told you that you are the one who killed our mother. I had nothing to do with her death, no. Yoke sobbed, you were definitely the one who killed my mother. You took her away from me, and I had to grow up without her. She punched Sekira in the chest with her left fist and snapped, you stole her. Sekira put a hand to her own chest as her sister's punch really hurt, and she yelled, you hit me in the boob. You deserved it. Yoke yelled back at her. You took her and hid her away from me. I finally found her, but you just murdered her all over again. What are you talking about? Yoke answered, you were the only mother I knew. The air around the room became still as Sekira realized the true role she had taken on in her youth. She was Yoke's older sister, but she was much more to her. Yoke punched her in the breast again and said, you murdered her, murderer. Sekira finally had enough, so she punched her little sister in her breast and screamed, it hurts, doesn't it? If you punch me in the boob one more time, I'll twist your nipples off. Yoke covered her own breast with her left arm and then said, okay, no more boob pummeling. Sakura glanced at their father's sword that her little sister still held, and she questioned, Are you going to strike me down? No, Yoke answered. You are my sister. I thought I was your mother. That too, Yoke replied as she went over, picked up the scabbard, and sheathed the sword. What about your revenge? I decided to use the blunt side of our father's sword. What are you talking about? Sakura questioned her. He told me, meddlesome priestess, Sakura mumbled. That meddlesome priestess is the reason we are both still standing here, Yoke stated. He told me that our father's sword has two sides. A katana doesn't have a double-edged blade, Sekira insisted. I said the exact same thing. He told me that our father's sword has a side that is very sharp that can take and defend lives. She also said our father's sword has a blunt side that's dull and has no edge that can show mercy and forgiveness. I don't understand, Sekira spoke. Why would you want to forgive anyone who has wronged you? We all make mistakes. 
When someone wrongs us and the wrong is great, we become bitter toward them. Our own soul is hurt by this bitterness, and the bitterness will continue to hurt us until we can let go of these ill feelings. If we forgive, truly forgive, we can work toward healing our soul. Sekura questioned her, what if the person does not ask for forgiveness? What if I don't want your forgiveness? I still need to forgive you for my own sake, Yoke told her. I must forgive you for your part in our father and brother's deaths. I don't want your forgiveness. It's too late. I've already given it to you. I don't accept it. I can't. That part is up to you. I've done all that I can on my end. You see, Yoke spoke as she rubbed her bruised breast. I had to decide because I couldn't have both. I can't have my revenge and regain my family. I had to choose and I chose you. I will forgive you for what you did to our family. I will forgive you for wanting a better standing to our father. But you should know, father adored you. You were the oldest. I know, Sekira said. I didn't realize the true position I had until after I had destroyed everything. You are not completely to blame for what happened, Horosha stated. I am convinced that there were other forces at work that night and they just used you. I know, will you go after them? I don't think so. I have you back in my life. I can continue my work as Horo and help people with the blessing I was given. Have sword, we'll travel. You saw my advertisement. I did, Sekira replied. It could use a little work. It doesn't really state the services you are willing to offer. I have done very well with it so far. Sakura thought of something, and then she said, So? You have access to the mysteries of the universe. Horosha laughed and then answered, It would make my job a whole lot easier if I did. She thought of her own question and asked, Did you really believe that I was a ghost? I, let's just say I realized you were flesh and bone once I grabbed hold of your kimono. What will you do now? I would like to stay with my sister for a few days if she will have me as a guest. Let me guess. You have already discovered that we have hot springs. Horosha nodded. Yes, you may stay as my guest, but who will be staying as my guest? Maybe it would be best that I remain Horo, Ronan Detective. Who gave you that title? I just did. How does it sound? You do know that a Ronan is a disgraced samurai. I can't call myself a samurai and I really like Lord Tante's title of samurai detective. Sakura shook her head and said, what am I going to do with you? Show me to the hot spring, bring me a new set of clothes, and feed me. Isn't that what a mother is supposed to do? Maybe I'll do that or maybe I'll kick you out, Sakura threatened her. And then she asked, what's to keep me from murdering you again? The knowledge that I might just haunt you. I still want to know how you survived my attack. Sakura spoke as she felt all over her sister's abdomen. Are you wearing armor? Horosha quickly moved away from her sister's unintended tickle attack as she answered. It's a secret. And it's also a blessing in disguise. Tea haiku. Tea with my sister. Dark brew of togetherness. Tea with many friends. Chapter 32. Leaving the governor's estate. Two weeks later, Horosha and Rico left the governor's estate. Horosha, what will you do now that you have found your sister? The boy asked. Have you already decided and that's why you've brought me out here? Are we to say our goodbyes? She reached over and ruffled his black hair, and then she answered. No, if I am to go on a job. Horosha reached into her sleeve and removed a koi tanto and gave it to the boy. I will need my apprentice with me. I can't be, Horo, Ron and Detective, without an apprentice. Thank you. I thought I'd have to return to the life I had before. Thank you. I won't let you down. Rico took the dagger and hugged her, and then he ran ahead. She spoke in a whisper, I had key put a blessing on that dagger so that it would serve you better than it did my brother and my sister. A few moments later, two men approached Horosha. I know you too, she said. You were with Kaido in the kitchen trying to take money that wasn't yours. One thug said, where is Kaido? We can't find him anywhere. Owning up to a bargain that I struck with him. You need to come with us, the other thug said. Our boss wants to see you. I don't have time to see your boss today, Horosha told them. I have my own business I must attend to. She turned away from them and then turned back and saw that they hadn't left. Was there something else? Our boss will be upset with us if we don't bring you back. Tell your boss that since I am causing him problems that he can hire me for half my normal wages. Horosha removed a hand ink paper with her advertisement on it and handed it to one of them. It might please your boss to hear this. I am somewhat known now. I am Horo, the Ronin detective. The boss does like those detective novels where he reads about the exploits of Lord Tante, the samurai detective. Well, there you have it. Your boss will be delighted to have a detective come and solve some mystery for him. You might want to tell him now, right? The one thug said, and then they both ran off. Horosha saw that Rico had run all the way to the local postings where she nailed up her advertisement when she first came into town. It was also the first place they had met. Rico removed a paper from the erected wood wall and ran back to her. What did the two thugs want? Nothing important, but I do think we need to go ahead and leave town for a while. She replied and then asked, 
What do you have there? You have a job offer, he told her. Let me see, Horosha said as she took the paper and read it over. It looks like we will be traveling to the next town. It would seem that our new employer heard how I had solved the mystery of the missing black pearl necklace from Otsudai-san, the housekeeper, and has requested our help with their own problem. She started to walk, and Rico walked beside her. We should be there before noon. I hope they do feed us. You should add that to your fee, the boy told her. Food, lodgings, and a monetary fee. I will let you handle the financial side of our business, Horosha spoke. You do have a knack for it. Horo, yes, thank you. Thank you for taking a chance on me. I should be thanking you, Rico. Without you, I wouldn't have found my sister. I wouldn't be on a different path right now. I would still be trying to kill the one who is solely responsible for massacring my family. I owe you a great debt, Rico. One, I hope one day to repay. They walked on for about a minute, and then Horosha said, I think we should also add a bath as part of our fee. If the places we go don't have their own hot spring, they should pay our way into a bathhouse. You're obsessed. It is my vice, but at least, it's a very clean one, Horosha spoke, then pointed ahead, and said, this way. Let's spread the fame of Horo, Ron and Detective. Didn't you tell Lord Tante these words? You are so concerned with impressing people that you are missing clues. You enjoy your fame so you focus too much energy on keeping it. Remove the obstacles and your disability will be no more. I did, but if we don't spread my fame, we won't make any money and if we don't make any money, we won't eat. Rico put a hand to his mouth and yelled, make way. Make way for Horo, the great Ron and detective. The end. Next. How to frame a murder. Part 1. Cat painting mystery.